Becoming the Iceman, Pushing Past Perceived Limits by Wim Hof and Justin Rosales. Forward. Becoming the Iceman is a project inspired by Wim and Justin to show the world that anyone can adopt the ability to become an Iceman or Ice Woman. The project's goal is to show that the ability to control the body's temperature is not a genetic defect in Wim, but rather an ability that can be adopted by anyone. For many generations, we've been taught to fear the cold, hearing things like, don't forget your jacket. You don't want hypothermia, do you? Put your gloves on before you get frostbite. Now, of course, these can be consequences of extreme cold temperatures, but with a proper understanding, anyone can learn to use the cold as a natural teacher. Now, you may have seen Wim running around on television, barefoot in the snow or swimming in ice cold waters. Now, while he's doing these incredible feats, he isn't worried about how cold it is. He's enjoying himself. Like any new tool, you must understand how it works before you can use it efficiently. This pertains to the cold as well. Wim is the epitome of what can happen if someone uses the cold to train the body. Now, you might ask, how can you prove that anyone can learn this ability? Well, we're glad you asked. As of fall 2009, Justin Rosales had no experience with the cold whatsoever. He was a college student attending Penn State University. And after Justin's friend Jarrett showed him one of Wim's videos on YouTube, they became exceedingly interested in understanding this ability. They wanted to see if it was possible for anyone to learn. And so they thought, why not test it on ourselves? Now in spring 2010, after speaking to Wim for several months via email, Wim invited Justin to attend a workshop in Poland for 10 days. After many days of working as a dishwasher, Justin was able to pay for his trip to Poland and learn the technique of the Iceman. With more training and countless experiences with the cold, Justin began to slowly adapt. The length of time he could remain exposed to the cold increased dramatically. He quickly realized that the technique to withstand the cold was, indeed, an ability that could be harnessed by anyone. This book tells the tale of Wim and Justin's journey to becoming the Iceman. Chapter 1, Breaking the Ice by Wim Hof. Just do it. Right on. Go for it. That's what I always say. I've come to a point in my journey where I can finally say I did it. Now's the time to write about my experiences. I've been a pioneer all my life, and I think it's best to finally share my wisdom with the rest of the world. Fear and trust are the components of the human psyche. Though the path may be to ascend up steep mountains, I use no auxiliary tools, only my mind. Many years ago, I lived in the Spanish Pyrenees, making money by working as a canyoning instructor. The beautiful canyons that surrounded me were made when water excavated natural doorways into the massive mountains of the Spanish Pyrenees. To go canyoning safely, you need ropes, wetsuits, watertight buckets, backpacks, and a lust for adventure. These are the essential things needed to safely guide people through the labyrinths of rocks and steep walls. The feeling is always good after a strenuous day in the canyons, simply because you have to comply with whatever nature dictates. The aching muscles are signs of a hard day's work. When traveling through the canyons, it's important to stay centered and focused within. Don't worry about the fear. Embrace it. Centering, instead of thinking too much, creates a physiological process that affects both the body and the mind. If you're centered, vertigo is controlled, and every descent teaches you to trust the equipment and yourself. There comes a point when the vertigo is nothing but a mathematical problem within the mind. Once you know the proof, you can reach the solution with practice. Doing this gives control over the mind and an understanding of your limits. Using that serene point of view, anyone can begin to enjoy the grandeur of their surroundings during their descent. This is the moment that most people enjoy when they come to the Pyrenees. I know the paths through the mountains like a child knows the shortest and nicest way to his favorite spot. During our expeditions, I would point out the flora, which are also known as plants, the fauna, which is also known as animal life, and the geological structures of the Pyrenees. In a way, it soothed the people that I led because it gave them an understanding of my experience and hopefully gave them more of a reason to trust me. When we would finally reach the upper part of a canyon by focus and concentration and strength, my followers would begin to feel the fear inside of them. It is at that time that I would explain to them that the journey was about overcoming that fear and becoming stronger. Overlooking the mountains, there are many beautiful monoliths standing alone as if an enormous artist sculpted them. In my mind, one monolith stands out among the rest, El Huso, also known as the Spindle. To me, it looks like one of the stone heads on Easter Island. It is the mysteriousness that catches my attention. Like a magnet, it draws me in. One day, while I was traveling through the Pyrenees alone, I decided to examine the behemoth. As I got closer, the rock seemed bigger and bigger. 
Touching it from all sides, I calculated her height and the possible climbing routes. I then decided that I would soon tackle this majestic entity and climb this amazing rock with no rope or safeguards. My fear and trust began to initiate their irrational beliefs of a near-death reality. My body tightened at the thought of falling. Now was not the time to climb. Descending back the way I came, I contemplated how I would approach my climb. I went deeper into myself as I felt my determination growing stronger. I told no one of my plan to ascend the mysterious rock. It was my challenge, and I had hoped that it would help me look deeper into my soul. I began to train my body, doing push-ups on my fingertips, pulling myself up on doorways using only my fingertips, and meditating on the single thought of climbing. That's when the nightmares began. I dreamt that I was climbing El Huso, and I was controlled by fear. It was an overwhelming sense of powerlessness that seemed too impossible to overcome. Fear does not go away by itself. You have to confront your fear, mold it, then learn to control it in its own irrational reality. Every human being has the power to do just that. To go deep within and confront your inner being is a powerful act. Going deep and developing the willpower is the only way. For days, I continued training, visualizing the climb, concentrating on the hunger inside of me. I developed a determined focus that I knew would only grow stronger. The nightmare slowly began to fade, telling me that it was almost time to climb. The day my nightmare stopped, I realized that the fear was gone and my trust had replaced it. Trust is the element needed to conquer fear. I went to where El Husa was, located, and eyed up my worthy adversary one last time. It was at that point that I realized I forgot my climbing shoes, but there was no turning back now. I emptied my mind and just let go. It's important to be mentally prepared before beginning. Being badly prepared or not confident in something this dangerous could lead to serious injury. As I started to climb, I realized a light feeling of being inside of me. I had a powerful grip in my hands and there were no anxious thoughts holding me back. Just do it, I thought. Silence and emptiness aided my conquering of fear. These elements are also present in meditation. In a way, this was my own form of meditation. After reaching the top, I felt a wave of self-worth and excitement. I climbed down and back up several more times. I felt like a child in El Huso was my playground. A couple of years later, my photographer, Henny Bogart, traveled with me to the Pyrenees to do some solo pictures for an outdoor magazine. We went back to El Huso and Henny began to take many pictures as I climbed without the aid of ropes or gear. He took a lot of beautiful shots, but I asked him if he thought anything could be done better. He mentioned that the lighting was a bit off, so the pictures were a bit dimmer than he would have liked. So I said, then I'll climb it tomorrow. The next morning we returned and I prepared myself as I had before. After climbing for a bit and reaching a height that would definitely kill me if I fell, I developed a cramp in my right calf. I was rendered motionless as the pain quickly became crippling. I really could do nothing but hold on to the rock for my dear life. I tried to shake my leg, but there was no space, only a few centimeters. I had no room for error. Otherwise, I would quickly meet my demise. I was on the edge of losing control, and one mistake could end it all. Out of options, I tried something new. I tried to think my cramp away. Visualizing the part of my leg that was throbbing, I began to loosen that area in my mind. Soon enough, the muscle in my leg began to relax, and for the first time ever, I realized that I could consciously think away a muscle cramp. I believe it was a direct result of knowing the body with my mind. That experience made me realize that overcoming fear by trusting the body and the mind can increase the potential for success as long as you just do it. Chapter 2, Philosophy, The Love for Knowledge by Wim Hof. When I was 13, I spent my autumn holiday reading a book about psychology. It was a book with mysterious concepts that I hoped I would soon understand. I knew the text held value, so I committed my time and separated myself from the world to gain a better understanding. The psychological terminology gave birth to my inquisitive mind and the urge to philosophize everything around me. It was then that I began to see the world in a different light. All at once, I wanted to learn about different cultures, traditions, and new languages. I applied for a passport as soon as I was of age, excited when I finally received it. I packed my bright orange backpack, and with my thumbs up, I hitchhiked to Morocco. When I was traveling through Belgium, I thought it would be helpful to learn a few catchphrases that would help me survive. I was taught French in school, but it wasn't enough to get by. Luckily, the people I met while traveling were willing to teach me a few important phrases like, 
Are you going to Paris? Thank you. Uh, where is the bathroom? Where am I? Using this method, I progressively learned French. Later on in my life, I came to learn many other languages this way through similar methods, such as Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Japanese, Sanskrit, which was actually from a teacher, and Polish. I had also learned German from living one kilometer away from the border of Germany. Dutch, however, is my native language. I've come to understand that if you want to learn something badly enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. Having the will to search and succeed is very important. Even though I had learned many languages, I still felt like there was something missing. As I approached my adolescence, I became more inquisitive. I knew about the great philosophers, the seers, traditions, cultures, and esoteric disciplines, yet something was missing. I believe an inquisitive mind always finds what it's looking for. It is that irrational curiosity that ultimately stumbles upon the answer. I found my answer in December when I was 17. I was home thinking about this, this hole in myself when I suddenly noticed the snow outside. As the snowflakes began to cover the multicolored environment in a beautiful white blanket, a warm feeling washed over me. I watched until the snow grew thick on the ground and I embraced the white desert as the snow began to fall harder. I needed to go out into it. So after I put on my shoes and a thick pullover jacket, I was off. That crispy sound when walking over a new layer of snow filled my ears as the strange but beautiful white blanket changed the appearance of the land. There was intimacy and a sort of mysticism that filled the cool air. Nearby, a couple of kids were rolling around in the snow, wrestling with each other. This moment called me to reminisce about my past. Now here, Wim is actually reflecting back to a few years prior to him writing this message. And he says, when the first snow fell three years prior to this moment, I had a similar urgency to go out into it. I took off my shoes and began walking around the nearby park with my wife and son. After about an hour of walking around, Noah, my son, bent over to make a snowball. Noah finished his creation and we continued walking while he held it at his side. My wife and I laughed and talked as we admired the newly covered Amsterdam. An hour later, we returned home. I went to take off my son's jacket when I realized that he was still holding on to the ball of snow in his hands. He told me he wanted to put it in the fridge and store it. Like most children, they wanted things to last forever. So, we let him cherish the memory by storing the snowball in the freezer. I grew curious as to how he was able to hold on to that chilled ball for so long and not complain about the pain. I asked Noah to show me his hands so that I could see if there was any damage. And to my surprise... His hands weren't even cold at all. In fact, they were incredibly warm. I'll never forget my son's first experience with the cold. Anyway, there I was in the snow-covered pasture, when I felt an irrational urge to take off my socks and shoes. Barefooted, I became strangely aware that it was not cold, just soft. There was an absence of pain. Instead, I felt a great feeling of joy and power. My conceptual being was flabbergasted. I wandered around in the snow for hours, taking in the vast whiteness. It inspired me. Whenever something touches me in a way that makes me reflect, I don't feel like quitting. I don't feel limits, just a greater sense of being. That is the essence of meditation, where thoughts are no longer consciously driven. That moment made a monumental impact in my life. The experience changed the way that I thought about the cold. At the time, I couldn't understand how but it changed the way I perceived it. It was my new friend. To me, expanding consciousness is the path to true knowledge. The material you learn from books ultimately leads to an expanding consciousness. And that experience finally quenched my thirst for knowledge. I now felt peace within and my mind was still. Everyone will experience these moments at some point in his or her life. I'm convinced that it's these moments that are meant to show us that there is more to life than satisfying our desires. Sometime after this experience, I traveled 200 kilometers up north to Amsterdam, the cosmopolitan city. I wanted to meet fresh new minds. I had hoped to meet poets, writers, painters, Holland's best yoga teachers, karate experts, and more. The thirst for knowledge continued to grow inside of me, and Amsterdam, I realized, couldn't fix it. I was clueless as to how to quench that thirst, and I quickly became lethargic. That's when I began to think about challenges, I wanted to conquer something, something that would make me feel more productive. And that's when the idea came to me. 
I would travel from Amsterdam to Dakar, Senegal on bicycle with my brother Andre. The idea had potential to break the pattern, yet it was powerful enough to get me back on my feet. I had found some hope. Chapter 3, The Road to Dakar by Wim Hof Amsterdam is a city with a lot of channels. The city was built on a marsh 700 years ago, 25 kilometers from the North Sea. Since Amsterdam is adjacent to many bodies of water, we have a lot of rainy days here. Our people are known for their tolerance to the near-constant rainfall. Although Amsterdam is a nice and colorful city, it was just too crowded for me. The center of Amsterdam was always clustered with cars and everything just seemed so busy. After a while, I became fed up with it all. The idea of traveling to Dakar, Senegal quickly shifted from just an idea to a reality. Andre and I threw our old newspaper delivery bags onto the back of our bikes and set forth on an adventure. In October, you can expect a lot of rainfall here in the Netherlands. The first few days of our travel were no different. When we arrived in Ardrinus, Belgium, the air turned cold and the atmosphere had a chilling effect. We found shelter under a small overhang on the side of the road. As cars passed by, they splashed water onto our bikes parked against the wall. We were extremely fatigued from pedaling through the hilly regions and our stomachs were growling. I remember sitting there with Andre in the darkness, drenched and starving. The only food we had to eat was dry chlorine flakes. We brought the food to our mouths and ate in silence. Usually, we're very talkative and enjoy conversing over a good meal. However, due to our immense exertion, we simply looked at the road and concentrated on savoring every bite of our food. It was a cold night, but we traveled a bit more until we found shelter at a bus stop. With a full stomach and the comfort of each other's presence, we fell asleep. Our bodies may have been cold and wet, but we slept like rocks. We went hard that day. The meal and the sleep were well-deserved. Moments like those put my mind at ease. It's a resting place for my mind so that I may feel accomplished yet relaxed. When we woke up, we shrugged off the fatigue, hopped on our bikes, and took off at the break of dawn. It was a new day and the rain had finally stopped. We picked up a lot of distance while we biked over the hilly countryside. The northern part of France was also chilly when we arrived, but luckily there was no rain. We biked through the northern part of France in two days and arrived in Lyon. There was a noticeable change in the atmosphere. The houses were no longer made of bricks, but instead replaced with stones and wooden beams. The landscapes changed even more as we continued. There were different varieties of trees and flowers. We could tell that we were getting farther and farther into the southern part of Europe by the vastness of the Mediterranean Sea. There was an overabundance of colors as we passed by palm trees, fig trees, bright sunshine, and good food. As a Dutch guy who hadn't seen much of the outside world, cycling by the Mediterranean Sea opened my eyes. I was enjoying the breeze blowing through my hair, the rush of not knowing what would happen next, and embracing the differences of the new, but wonderful world outside of my home. I felt a change coming. You know, a lot of the world may view me as the one and only Wim Hof, but that's not entirely true. Andre is my identical twin brother. We are genetically the same and look exactly alike. And because of the genetic similarities, we know each other extremely well. This drives our sharing for the love of plants, trees, rocks, the sun, and the beautiful landscapes. And on our adventure, Andre and I spoke of a lot of things. One of the topics that we spoke of was a change that we felt inside. We discussed the changes of mind, the mind itself, and enlightenment. When pondering the purpose of our trip, I felt something shift inside. I didn't know what it was, but it was powerful. We continued on pedaling through the majestic mountains of the Pyrenees along the coast of Spain. Here, we actually met a German cyclist named Wolfgang. Wolfgang told us that he had ridden his bike through Africa, and our minds clicked as we shared inspirational stories. He started by telling us a story of when he was traveling through the Nubian desert. He was walking through the desert with his bike by his side when he noticed a lion lying behind the bush that he had just passed. When he gazed into the lion's eyes, his body became paralyzed. And after a couple minutes, the lion turned away and fled. This story really impressed me and I was really interested in learning more from the man that I had just met. So while biking along the coast of Spain, Wolfgang, Andre, and myself discussed our interest in Zen. Specifically, we spoke of a spirit behind it and the different religions, cultures, and traditions it relates to. The discussion gave us understanding of what contemplation was all about. Contemplation is the state of mind where your focus resides in the mind moving your focus as you talk. It is a state of mind that exercises the real understanding of the self. If you exercise the mind by making sense of 
what is said, while contemplating your own thoughts, the mind becomes lighter and understanding is possible. A good point to get to is when the thinking process stops and energy dissipates consciously. This is known as samadhi in yoga. We talked for days and contemplated even more. We tried to understand the meaning of life and the purpose of all of us traveling together. We had no books, no seers, and no references. Luckily, I believe that true wisdom lies inside oneself. That evening, we slept in a melon field near Valencia. Consciousness is a physical state of being that is aware of oneself and one's own surroundings. If this state of mind is exercised, it becomes simpler to navigate, like a child gaining motor skill experience by tinkering around with different ways of movement. If you believe in an omnipresence, this is the way to make an ethereal connection. Similar to the way a GPS navigates the direct route to our destination, your mind can find the best way for you to connect with that omnipresence. To get to that point, one needs to go within and gather the energy to just do it. There is no false mysticism needed to explain what it's all about. If it's inside you, just do it. If you want conviction, dig within yourself. If you want clarity, strive for understanding. If you want understanding, get wisdom and gain experience by just doing it. You cannot bring yourself to understanding while you constantly worry. It happens when you are able to consciously let go. Don't think your goal is untouchable, something that has to be understood by science. It is very simple for those who want to make it a reality because once they find their path, they will stay on it at all costs. I came to this realization during one of the days we were riding through the Spanish countryside. By the time I had woken, Andre and Wolfgang had already left to get a cup of coffee from a local cafe. I lay there for a while, exploring the epiphany that I had just discovered the day before. It was the first time in my life that I realized I was aware of everything. Pure awareness is something to strive for. You will understand the meaning of the altered state if you choose to go for it. It is literally an eye-opening experience. For those who adopt pure awareness, they believe it is the best experience able to be gained during this life. It is a simple but unique experience. We're all unique. Don't think it's difficult. It's just a different state of mind. Anyone is able to get it like the fruit from a tree once it's ripe. This true nature of perception is simple and has never left us. Just look within, understand, contemplate, and exercise the state of the mind until it makes sense. Once the resource is tapped into, the wonders of life begin to appear to you. Try it. We went our separate ways when Wolfgang caught a boat transfer from Valencia to Tanzania. Andre and I continued traveling south through Spain and into Elche, which is the largest population of palm trees in Europe. We then decided to cycle to Almeria through the Sierra Nevada. When we were on the coast about 50 kilometers from Almeria, we stopped for a day to enjoy the beach. Andre the practical, as I called him, made an oven from stones so we could bake our own bread. A Danish man saw us baking our bread on the beach and sat down to talk with us for a while. He told us that he had bought a place up the coast and that they were cheap properties nearby. Splendid, I thought. Andre and I decided to purchase a property and live in the area for a bit. The place was ruined, but there were large amounts of banana trees, figs, crepes, and cacti surrounding us. It was like our own botanical paradise. We never did make it to Dakar, but we both found our true paths, the way to the self, and a botanical paradise. Chapter 4, A State of Mind by Wim Hof Once you know the way to your spiritual destiny, you can change. Once you realize there are no limits in your mind, you can change. Once you realize there are no boundaries to what is possible, you can change. Moving toward change is important. It will become evident once you begin to work for it. Achieving success is the result of the right practice, no matter what that may be, and the right discipline, and the right road. Era mi solo recordar los caminos que tienen corazón que al alcanzar la iluminación. This roughly translates to, the path my heart chooses will lead me to enlightenment. It all depends on the path you choose and the decisions you make. In the end, it will all make sense. And until then, the heart is your guide. I trust this wisdom as truth in nature. It pushed me through every challenge, fear, and obstacle. Now, my final challenge is to go beyond and get in contact with my omnipresence, where we all live, but from which many are disconnected. I'm not saying that I alone have the right to become connected. I believe anyone and everyone can do it. Chapter 6 the Search Back to Myself by Wim Hof, January 1999. While reading the newspaper one day, I noticed one relatively short article. 
It was a column that included a photo of a person doing their job in the cold. Each day, there was a new person in the paper doing a different job. Since it was the middle of winter, I'm sure the paper thought it would be nice to write about people who were willing to brave the cold for their jobs. There were articles on merchants, window washers, firefighters, farmers, and even prostitutes. I was initially interested in this section of the paper because I swim in ice water every day. I thought it would be a good idea to give the newspaper company a call, let them know, and talk to them about my hobby. It turned out to be a great idea as they were very interested to hear my story. One of the journalists scheduled an appointment to meet at the lake where I regularly partake in my activity. When the journalist arrived, we headed out to the lake so I could show him my hobby. Typically, when I go out for these cold swims, I start by cutting a hole in the frozen ice and then submersing myself. After I completed this, the journalist took a couple of pictures of me treading in the water. He then asked me some questions and I shared many stories of my experiences with the cold. The next day, I was in the newspaper. Wim Hof, in the newspaper. It was awesome. What I was not aware of at the time, however, was the impact of the news on the media as a whole. Apparently, every television station had read the article. Ten days after the article was released, television crews began to visit my daily swims and started filming my cold exercises. At least twice a day, television stations, magazines, and newspapers were interviewing me. The media had entered my life. I remember one specific interview quite vividly. During this particular interview, I was being filmed doing some swimming and yoga exercises. I began by cutting two holes out of the ice that were seven meters apart. The exercise consisted of me entering the first hole, swimming underneath the frozen ice, and emerging from the other side. When I came out of the water, my body was steaming. Afterward, I showed that I had remained completely flexible by doing yoga flexibility exercises. As the camera crew was packing up, I began to put on my clothes and glanced out over the lake and saw a man walking in the middle of the ice. And a moment later, the ice started to crack below his feet and he fell through. Since it was windy that day, a lot of the ice was not equally thick around the lake. Apparently, this man didn't know that. Everyone around me just stood and watched. No one did anything to help. The man was struggling and couldn't get himself out of the hole. Every time he tried to pull himself out, the ice would break beneath him. Half-dressed, I sprinted toward the man in peril. He was about 100 meters out, and as soon as I reached him, I offered my hand to help pull him out. Just as we grasped hands, the ice cracked beneath me, and I too fell through. It caught me off guard, but I didn't panic. I wanted to remain calm in the presence of this very anxious-looking man. I started talking to him in an attempt to calm him down. I thought this would help bring him back to his senses, and I said, I'm going to push you up onto the ice, but you have to equally divide the weight of your body so that the ice doesn't break again. He followed my instructions obediently as I pushed him onto the ice. When all was said and done, he ended up suffering from only a mild case of hypothermia, but at least he was safe and he had done no serious damage. In dangerous situations like these, you should always try to regain control and calm your senses. Most of the time, you can get yourself out of the dilemma by finding a logical solution. Meanwhile, the cameras had been rolling for the entire event. It was all over the news that evening. The next day, I was in the paper and had even more media representatives visiting me. Many other articles were published and more of my yoga, ice climbing, swimming, and running experiences were spread throughout Europe. One of the articles even coined the name that most know me as today, The Iceman. But soon after, I, now The Iceman, began to prepare for a high altitude run. I was going to attempt my first half marathon. The run would take place in Tibet on the northern side of Everest, where I would run barefooted in the snow, wearing only shorts. At 5,000 meters, which is 16,500 feet, there is only half the amount of oxygen density in the air. We need oxygen for combustion to create warmth in the body. To be able to survive in higher altitudes, we need to acclimatize, a process where more red blood cells are produced in the body to allow for more oxygen to be carried by the blood. This will compensate for the lower amount of oxygen in the air at this level. At 7,200 meters, which is 23,760 feet, the body reaches the threshold of its ability to adapt. It's known as the death zone. At that altitude, the body begins to deteriorate. During my preparation for the run, I met with a professor who had heard of my feats through recent publicity. He was connected to a research institute called TNO. He invited me to take part in an interesting experiment. I accepted his invitation because I was deeply interested in the research and the results it would produce. When I arrived at the research center to meet with a professor, he led me to the spot where the experiment would take place, the thermophysiological area. During our walk, the professor explained to me that his field was thermophysiological sciences. Even though he had taught material on different temperatures and how the body reacts to them, 
he wasn't very fond of the cold. For the professor, like most other humans, the warmth is a comfort zone that he had problems stepping out of, somewhat of a primordial nature. I told him that I liked the cold simply because it awakens all kinds of powerful feelings within me. He then began to explain what would happen in his experiment. The name of it was cold-induced vasodilation, also known as CIV. As I was listening, I became more attentive and began to prepare myself to perform the best I could in the coming experiment. Preparing oneself to perform well is typically a mental challenge that one must craft. You must make sure the body is focused 100% of the time. Where each limb moves, your mind must be there. Where your mind moves, your body must follow. He then proceeded to show me the experiment itself. I was astonished at how intricate the layout looked. What was so interesting was that the experiment would only consist of the upper part of my index and middle fingers. I would need to place the two fingers inside of a little perspex box with ice water. He told me that the people who work regularly in the cold, like fishermen who need to work with their hands cleaning fish at sea, have incredible vasodilation in their hands. Vasodilation has to do with the opening of veins and arteries to help increase blood flow to certain areas of the body. When exposed to the cold, there is a natural constriction of the veins in the extremities. It kicks in to protect and maintain the heat of the inner core temperature. The blood that circulates around the core is very important because it helps maintain functioning in the liver, heart, lungs, and brain. Therefore, the core must remain around 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, for the body to function properly. If the core temperature raises or drops even 2 degrees, the body begins to malfunction. When exposed to the cold, the blood's temperature can drop below 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the veins in the hands constrict. When the hand warms up again, the veins open back up. Usually, it's an automatic physiological mechanism of the body that we are unable to influence. By training through regular exposure, we are able to influence that mechanism dramatically. At first, that was merely my opinion. Later on, I would be backed up by several cold physiological experiments at Radboud University Hospital, but I'll speak more about that later. The professor that told me that the veins and the extremities of a person well-conditioned to the cold, like those found in the hands of a fisherman, will open up after two minutes on average. For someone that is somewhat able to withstand the cold, it would take up to four minutes. For a normal individual, it could take up to eight minutes. In my case, the professor was convinced that my veins were very well conditioned. He knew I was someone who regularly exposed himself to the extreme cold. He then sat me behind an iron table where the little perspex box laid. I saw the ice water inside and a few ice cubes sitting on the top of the box. He connected my index and middle finger to a couple of iron receptors that would be able to gauge the temperature of my fingers as they were exposed to the ice water. He would be able to monitor the data on a nearby screen. As soon as I placed my fingers into the ice water inside of the tiny perspex box, the experiment began. The temperature in my fingers soon dropped to 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and we waited. After two minutes, my veins didn't open. Not even after four, eight, or even 10 minutes. The temperature continued to drop and there was no movement in my veins whatsoever. After 16 minutes with my veins closed, I fainted and fell to the ground. The experiment was over. What happened? Results like this implied that the conditioning of my veins was not very good at all. After explaining my intention to run half a marathon barefooted through the snow at an altitude of 5,000 meters, which is, again, 16,500 feet, the professor told me that I would have many difficulties with my veins not opening up. If I were to do my run with my veins in this condition, I would be susceptible to severe cold injuries, especially because I would be exposing my body to freezing temperatures in high altitudes simultaneously. I went home extremely concerned and worried. The results made me feel a little hesitant about performing a new challenge, especially one that no one had attempted before. I was not sure whether or not I would be able to achieve success. But what I did know was that no matter what, I would always give my best until it is impossible for me to proceed. Even though what had happened at the research center may have concerned me, I was not the kind of person to give up that easily. My heart is strong, but my mind is stronger. Before all that research, I had believed that I could do it. Call it intuition, if you will. I've learned how to trust my mind in its direct contact with the nervous system, the immune system, blood circulation, and heart, and this would be the key to my success for the upcoming challenge. The time finally came for me to leave for my half marathon, and with the research at TNO still in my mind, I surrendered my emotions and bent like a bow, to which my success would be the arrow released. I knew I could leave nothing behind and had to give it my all. When we interact with nature, miraculous things can happen. Whenever you go beyond the rigid patterns of thinking, challenging yourself, you can receive a bounty of experience from hard nature. 
with a camera team from a national television broadcaster. I flew from Amsterdam into Abu Dhabi and then to Kathmandu. Kathmandu was a very beautiful place with a vivid society. In a town with little money in circulation and a small infrastructure, the townspeople seemed to be carefree. Like many other towns with little to no money, people are still happy with less. Many of us take belongings for granted, but these people survive with only the bare necessities, and that makes most of them content. It's a remarkable experience to see their smiling faces in an environment where most of us would feel uncomfortable living without access to normal technology like television, cell phones, video games, and more. From Kathmandu, we drove through Nepal and its hilly countryside full of banana trees. There were many colorful trees along the way, and just as many flowers, dusty roads, and rivers. I loved the beautiful exuberance of it all. I'm always delighted to see how different things are in new places. If you're a sensitive individual, beautiful sights bring about extraordinary feelings. For me, this is typically true, but I reminded myself that I was there with a mission. While we were driving through the countryside, the experiment at TNO crossed my mind a few more times. Even though I was ready to do my best, I was still wary of the possibility that things might go wrong. We then stopped for a bit so the film crew could record me crossing a big river with a strong current. They thought it would be a good shot for the television special. When we got to the Tibetan-China border, we switched cars and went through the immigration process. A young Chinese translator and a large Tibetan driver accompanied us to the Friendship Highway, which is also known as the Gate to Hell. We passed a lot of steep, curvy roads as we drove up from 1,200 to 3,800 meters, which is 3,960 to 12,540 feet, to the Tibetan Plateau. As we drove into the largest village on the mountain, we were surrounded by a bunch of shacks, stony buildings, and chilly weather. The Himalaya Hotel, which is where we stayed that night, was nothing more than some dirty curtains, a few beds with blankets to keep out the cold, and warm tea. After eating dinner at a nearby restaurant, we returned to our beds and attempted to sleep. I'd never been at an altitude of such great heights before. I didn't know what to expect. I felt strange. My mouth was dry and tingling. I was lightheaded. Overall, I, I just felt off. The feeling only got worse as the night progressed. I had a splitting headache for the better portion of the evening. I cursed at the darkness yelling, what the hell have I gotten myself into? Eventually, I drifted off into sleep and awoke the next morning feeling slightly better. My headache disappeared and I felt like I had found some newborn energy. It made me full of lust for the coming adventure. I ate my breakfast with vigor and joy. I was so excited that I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I spoke at breakfast about the challenge to come. Afterwards, we departed for Lalung La Pass at 5,060 meters, which is 16,698 feet. We needed to meet with the translator and the driver again. The rocky area of the Tibetan Plateau knows of little plants or trees. The higher the altitude, the more the vegetation diminishes. When you reach 5,000 meters, which is 16,500 feet, there's no longer any vegetation. The only thing that remains are rocks, dirt, and you. While driving up the mountain, we occasionally passed Tibetan houses. Most of them were colored purple or gray. It was an interesting sight when we would pass a Tibetan's house because each time, it would appear as if the wilderness had swallowed their homes. Climbing along the curves and turns of the mountain, it began to snow. This made me feel excited. I felt like I was grabbing the bull by the horns and holding tightly. We reached the top and a rush of adrenaline raced through me. I jumped out of the car, took off my clothing and sandals and began to run through the snow. The snow felt good between my toes and the running was relatively easy to do. I was now fully confident in my ability to run through the snow. I believed that whatever happened in the experiment must have been a mistake. I ran for an hour while the film crew recorded. The day was a success, but more important, I had finally shaken my uncertainty. Running at sea level is pretty easy, but when you're running at a high altitude, the rules are different, especially when you aren't completely acclimatized. Usually a person will get exhausted after running for just five minutes. I did surprisingly well and ran for a full hour and felt energetic the entire time. After the run, however, the headache kicked in again, and this time it would stay for days. It was absolutely terrible. I felt like my head was going to explode. <sighs> just before reaching 5,000 meters, which is 16,500 feet, we stopped at a little village to rest for the night. One of the crew members got sick from the high altitude, and the team decided that it would be best to take her back to Kathmandu. The only person that stayed from the team was Jasper, the cameraman. We stayed in the village for a couple more days to adjust. Each day, we would climb a little bit higher to get used to the altitude, and then return to the village. Climbing each day got me used to the lack of oxygen. Finally, I was able to function normally, and thankfully, headache-free, making me confident that the run would be a breeze. 
On a side note, I'd like to mention that something that struck me as bizarre, yet very interesting while I was in Tibet. I noticed a lot of Tibetan children collecting cow dung in the fields that surrounded the village. They usually had a calm expression on their face while performing this task and gave me a sense of tranquility unlike any other place. I've seen around the world, though the Tibetans lead a completely different lifestyle compared to people in the West. I had never before witnessed this kind of intrinsic peace that they were experiencing. It was the most impressive thing that I have ever witnessed in Tibet. It's something that I try to achieve myself each time I prepare for a challenge. Meanwhile, the day finally came when I would run my half marathon. We drove up past the 5,000 meter mark, which is 16,500 feet, over frozen dirt, snow, and ice. Eventually, we came to a point in the road where it was impossible for us to drive anymore. There was just too much snow. We stopped and began looking around for a starting point. We decided to put my clothes and other belongings behind a rock near the car so that I could run without carrying anything. We found a good spot and placed my things down. Here, I began to run, barefoot and in shorts, while Jasper was fully clothed, holding his camera. I felt remarkably good, gaining confidence as we moved forward. As we progressed through the snow and icy ground, I actually began to enjoy it all. While jogging along, I met a Tibetan woman singing on the slopes. Her song sounded sacred and beautiful. I greeted her in a respectful way with wholehearted gestures and continued on. After five hours of walking and jogging through the snow and ice, I realized that I was going to complete the challenge. I finished it with no problem whatsoever. Jasper said that all the shots looked beautiful and the footage was all on tape. We were both content. After the challenge, we drove back over the Friendship Highway through the Nepalese valleys and arrived at Kathmandu. We then drove out to the Stairway to Heaven. The Stairway to Heaven is at the bank of the Ganges, where they sacredly burn those who have passed away on a pile of firewood. I showed a couple yoga postures to some sadhus who lived in the area, and then we went on our way back to the Netherlands. With the marathon completed and my confidence restored, all was well. I was ready for a new challenge. Chapter 7 Suo Men Lenin Sisu Finnish Power by Wim Hof March 2000 Kolari Lapish, Finland A nationally distributed magazine contacted me with interest in taking a couple photos and performing an interview. The article's content would discuss natural drugs such as adrenaline, melatonin, endorphins, dopamine, and more. I agreed, did the interview, received a copy of the magazine later on. The article talked about adrenaline junkies such as skydivers, free climbers, rock climbers without safety gear, adventurists, and other people of this sort. The largest portion of this article covered my piece. It elaborated on many of my outdoor activities such as running in the snow, swimming in ice water, and climbing snowy mountains barefooted. The authors of the article believed that a high amount of dopamine and endorphins fuel my body for these cold endurance challenges. After the magazine was published, a lot of television stations became highly interested in me. They thought that they could create a good television special by recording me perform the activities mentioned in the magazine article. Soon after, a television crew was sent to my front door. Willebrand Frequin was one of these people that I had the pleasure to work with. Willebrand is a very well-known television presenter. He does a lot of interviews and is famous for unmasking people. I was surprised to find Mr. Frequin standing in the doorway. I had recently seen him on television during his weekly program interviewing a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Frequin told the cardinal, you c like everybody else, so what makes you so different? Of course, Frequin said these words with respect, but he always digs deep for the truth. He does this to go beyond a person's appearance or status. I liked that quality about him, so I treated him with great respect. Willebrod was a professional. He knew exactly how he wanted everything to look. He was very meticulous with his camera crew, and he constantly tried to get perfect shots. He challenged me. I started the interview by doing my yoga postures. He was amazed. He had never seen a body bend and twist the way mine had. I then dove into the icy waters and swam to the middle of the lake. I even held my breath for a few minutes under the ice. He was thoroughly impressed. Mr. Frequin was also nice enough to let me talk about my new book for the television special. He had his shots and I got free advertising out of it. It was a fantastic experience. A couple of days later, the special aired and even more people became interested in my life. About a month later, a team of people contacted me. They said they were highly interested in taking Willebrod and me to the northern part of Finland to swim under the ice. I was more than happy to go. I had never swam under large distances under the ice in the Netherlands, partly because the water isn't transparent. Also, swimming alone under the ice can be very dangerous, and I never wanted to take any extreme risks. The crew, however, wanted me to swim 50 meters under a layer of ice, one meter thick, in Lapland. When we finally left for our journey, I was excited. We arrived in Rovaniemi on the polar circle, and there, I saw a lot of snow and ice. 
Actually, those are the only things that were visible. I really wanted to go out and enjoy the snow, but we still had to drive further north for about another 200 kilometers, which is 124 miles, to reach Pelo. Occupied by 10,000 people, Pelo is a village beyond the Arctic Circle. When we arrived, the village was in the middle of an international ice sculpting competition. The sculptures were beautiful. It's amazing what people can do with ice. That night, from the room where I was sleeping, I saw thick snow falling with a silent presence. It was coming down harder than I had ever seen before. It made me ponder the event to come. According to our records, no one had ever swam 50 meters under ice water before. Not even me. I would be the first to do it. Physically, I was prepared, but inside, there was tension and fear. The following day, we went to the lake to see where the event would take place. We found a nice spot next to the deserted mine. The layer of ice on top of the water was almost one meter thick. The local divers club happily dug us a 4x4 meter hole out of the ice. They then placed an old Russian tent over it to prevent the ice from freezing again. Inside the tent, the hole looked like a blue diamond. The water was so clear that you could easily see the bottom of the lake 13 meters down, which is 39.6 feet. Even though it was beautiful, I was scared. I attempted to rid my fears by going into the water for a few minutes. I undressed, climbed down the steps that the divers had carved out of ice, and submerged myself into the blue diamond. It was a powerful experience. The thick ice that surrounded me was intimidating, yet inspiring. I had never seen ice that thick before. In the Netherlands, the ice was usually about 20 centimeters thick, possibly reaching even 30 centimeters during the coldest winters. Even the water itself was somehow different than the water in Holland. I felt a sense of claustrophobia. It was an eerie feeling. So I just floated in the water and didn't dive under. For the next few days, I returned to the tent to better associate myself with the water. There was a void in the abyss that intimidated me. During one of those days, while I was sitting in the water, I decided to dip my head under and take a look around. The water was clear and beautiful. My stomach eased as I felt adrenaline pour through me. I felt alive. <sighs> it's moments like these that one needs to face his fears. The best way to have such a moment is to gradually confront the fear and approach it in a way that is both exciting and inspiring. You have to be decisive and physically prepared to do your best. After that, little by little, you'll see progress. The progress I made each day in understanding the water made me feel more prepared for my dive. My nervous system had learned how to change things on a cellular level. Your nervous system has the potential to do the same. When there is more activity in your cells, it can create a feeling of power and control. This feeling can supply confidence to help you reach your goal. A couple of days later, after I had embraced my fears, the day came for me to go for a test swim. Nerves and determination were my silent allies. I remember beginning the day with a cup of coffee while I gazed out the window. We were to rehearse the record attempt with only a couple of people from the team. The goal was to see where all the cameras should be set up in order to get the best shot, and also for me to do the test swim. The crew's plan was to set up the cameras, and then I would swim 25 meters. In my head, I was determined to do the 50 meters, but I didn't tell anyone. Spontaneous events are puzzles in the mind that you have to figure out on the go. It's a part of living in the present. You have to be at your best and be alert to potential mistakes, because in the moment, the mind and its thinking process are one. You have to be ready to mold yourself to whatever life gives you. To be ready, you must be alert within. When we arrived at the frozen lake, we discussed the way things were going to happen. Inside, remember, I was plotting how I was going to achieve 50 meters on the practice swim, not just the 25. Nobody noticed that my mind was elsewhere. I kept it myself. A few minutes later, everyone was at their posts. The cameras were ready, and it was almost time for me to attempt my dive. During my final moments of preparation, I went within. You cannot be more ready for your challenge than when you trust yourself and your actions. And I did. I began my breathing exercises and drew more oxygen into myself. More oxygen in the muscles create a form of insulation and an ability to exercise for longer periods of time. This would help in two ways. First, having more oxygen would allow me to be able to swim longer distances. And second, the insulation would be helpful for my swimming in ice cold water. With the sharp and beautiful diamond in the ice inviting me, I finished the final steps of my preparation and slowly entered the water with determination. With my back against the ice wall, I took a few deep breaths to focus on my goal, 50 meters. I made sure to take careful breaths so I wouldn't disturb the oxygen saturating my body. With one last inhalation, I let go and dove under. I remember being glad that I had access to the ice water days before that rehearsal because at that moment, 
I was completely comfortable and felt no cold whatsoever. The adrenaline had taken over my body, and with each stroke, I felt more confident in my ability to succeed. The water just was refreshing. The crystal clear lake offered a beautiful view. I started counting my strokes as I swam. One, two, three. A few moments later, I passed the 25 meter hole and continued on like a torpedo. 28, 29. It was the 29th stroke where my vision began to get blurry. From my experience with swimming, I knew that each one of my strokes represented one meter and 20 centimeters of distance. This meant that I was about 35 meters when my vision became blurry. I didn't realize that the freezing water had the potential to damage my retina. Well, with my vision foggy, I couldn't see where I was going, but I kept moving. 47, 48, wait a second. I realized that I had gone too far. 42 strokes represented 50 meters. I calculated that before my swim, but due to the unexpected blindedness, I had lost my focus and passed the 50 meter hole. Now I was at least 57 meters away from where I had started. There were only three holes cut out of the ice, which meant that there were only three ways to get out. The starting point, the 25 meter mark, and the 50 meter mark. I was trapped. I decided to make a 180 degree turn to put myself back in the direction of the 50 meter hole. I then swam six strokes in an attempt to get back to stroke 42. I felt all around the ice above me and I just couldn't find the hole. It was at that point that I realized just the magnitude of the situation, but oddly enough, I didn't feel any panic. I, sw I swam in different directions trying to find the hole, but all of my attempts were in vain. My body began to, to feel light and I felt myself slipping, my mind slipping. The energy in my body diminished little by little as I swam around helplessly. As strange as it sounds, there, there wasn't pain. I was swimming into unconsciousness, and that's when it happened. All of a sudden, I felt a hand grip me by the ankle and pull me backwards. Yari, a member of the team, had saved my life and was dragging me back to the 50-meter hole. I went limp, letting him take me relaxed, and about 30 seconds later, we surfaced. Even though I was completely exhausted, I pulled myself out of the hole on my own. I sat there on the frozen lake for a while, just playing over what had just happened in my head. My body felt no pain, no cold, just exhaustion. After a few good breaths, I eventually came back to my senses and the exhaustion just faded away. And then an annoyance just built up inside of me and I yelled, you people, where was the emergency diver? You had everything but my safety planned out. Even though I was annoyed, there was a place in my mind where I was just extremely happy. Not only did I swim the 50 meters that would break the record, I swam more than 80 meters trying to get out of that hole. I was now completely confident in my ability to perform the world record with ease. As I looked into the eyes of death, I had overcome my fear once again. I thought to myself, wow, what a powerful experience. We then packed our things into the car and made our way back home. The next morning, when I woke up, I was completely at ease. Due to the events that had happened the day before, I figured nothing else could go wrong. I had swam 80 meters before I began to pass out. 50 meters should be a piece of cake. Everyone's attention was focused on making beautiful footage for the event. When I arrived at the site, they had a heated tent set up for me. The tent was more than I needed as I prefer to do things my own way. So I just sat on the ground and took notice of everyone else around me. The tension was high, like it usually is when there are expectations to fulfill. Everyone was working on something different. They were preparing the cameras, setting up the angles, and checking the water. They all were making preparations to make sure that the event ran smoothly. And so did I. I stayed there on the ground for a bit, meditating and focusing on the events to come. After some last-minute preparations by the crew, the time of action arrived. The divers, who'd be watching over my safety underwater, dove in. They opened the flap to the old Russian tent and told me that they were ready to go. During those last five minutes, as I walked over to the tent and prepared myself, I could feel the tension around me. Everyone was focused on the moment and what could go wrong. I was completely focused on reaching that 50 meter hole. When I reached the diamond shaped hole, I began to undress. The cameras were already rolling at that point, so it was time to go. I joked with Will abroad once more as I walked down the steps and then brought my attention to the icy water. 50 meters would be no problem at all as I remained focused. I took a few more careful breaths and dove under. I was under the ice again with a conviction. This time, I felt no stress. There was no question as to whether or not it was possible. I swam freely, not really focusing much because I knew I could reach 50 meters with no problem. 
At about the 40 meter mark, I realized that something had changed. The swim felt different somehow, different than the day before, and I was already tired. What had changed? I soon realized my focus was the problem. Focus is a delicate matter, and it is very important when provoking the mind to stay alert. My nervous system, immune system, and blood circulation need to all be working together in order to make my internal heating mechanism function properly. If I don't focus or give all my effort, everything will begin to unravel. And this is what happened to me under the icy depths. I finally made it to the 50 meter hole, but it was a lot harder compared to the 80 meters that I had completed the day before. As I emerged from the water, people on all sides congratulated me. And even though I ended up breaking the world record, I had learned an important lesson once again. Do your best at all times. Chapter 9, El Glosés, A Canyon in the Spanish Pyrenees by Wim Hof. Our bust had just departed from Leiden, a city famous for its old university. All around me, filling the seats, were 16 and 17-year-old students. I was sitting in the back of the bus, speaking to one of the professors about the book that she had just published. I told her that I had also recently written and published a book of my own. It was a long drive, full of conversation and laughter. We drove through the southern part of Holland, Belgium, and most of France. As the night approached, everyone fell into a deep, peaceful sleep. The following morning, when we had reached the southern part of France, we stopped at a rest stop for 15 minutes so that everyone could get out of their seats and use the restroom. And while everyone did their own thing, I walked to the other side of the parking lot just to stretch my legs. And as I began to walk back, I saw the bus leaving without me. I tried to get the attention of the bus driver by running and waving my hands violently, but my attempt failed. No one on the bus must have realized that I was gone because it just pulled away without me. I thought to myself, surely they'll notice that I am missing at some point and turn back for me. I waited and waited, but the bus didn't come back. It had left me behind. Apparently, the professor whom I had previously been speaking with had gone to a different seat on the bus to sleep. She never realized my seat was left vacant after our restroom break. As for everyone else, they too were just busy doing their own thing to realize my absence. It wasn't until they were about 400 kilometers from the rest stop when someone first recognized my absence. Once I acknowledged the fact that they just weren't coming back, I decided to hitchhike. Half an hour passed before a car finally stopped and my travels could finally continue. It went that way from one car to another until I finally reached the Pyrenees in Spain. It was a strange way to travel, but it worked for me. I didn't have my rucksack and it was still on the bus. The only thing I had on me was my passport. Yet somehow, things seemed to work out in my favor. A random stranger, once I told him of my predicament, just offered to rent me a hotel room for the night and pay for my dinner. Just, wow, that's nice. The following day, I continued my hitchhiking in three different cars. I spoke enthusiastically with the drivers about all kinds of things. The weather, the mountains, the geological structure, the canyons, and even philosophy. After a long journey, I finally arrived in the Pyrenees. It was an unexpected yet exciting adventure. When I had finally arrived at the camping site in Spain, I met up with a group again. They were extremely surprised to see me. Reunited, we set out on our adventure. They were ready to embark on what we had traveled there to do, to repel the canyons and see beautiful sights. Our first stop would be a canyon named El Glosés. El Glosés is a wet canyon in the Pyrenees. A lot of water passes through the canyon and people that venture there tend to get very wet. The water that flows down is typically cold because it drains from the high mountains. Therefore, wetsuits are used as a precaution when repelling El Glosés. With everyone prepared in their wetsuits, fashioned with rucksacks, belts, and ropes, we made our way to the canyon. From there, we started up sailing our way through the labyrinth of rocks and water. The path inside the canyon was a narrow one with steep walls. It was extremely dark, but a beautiful sight. To get through the canyon, we had to jump into pools of water, swim, balance on boulders, cross large rocks and crevices, jump gaps, and rappel into the abyss. Everyone had a lot of fun, despite the cold water that sprayed against us every step of the way. After many thrilling hours of canyoning, we arrived at the bottom. From there, we had to walk for another hour up the mountain to get back to the parked bus. Everyone was exhausted, but our spirits were high. That night, we all went to a local pub to enjoy each other's company while we ate good food and drank good wine. Everyone enjoyed the impression that nature had pressed upon us that day. Even the professors had enjoyed themselves. While in the pub, a wave of excitement washed over me. I suggested that we go back to the canyon right in the moment and do it all again. This time, we would do it in the dark. Another adventure. The students were overwhelmed with excitement and were ready to go. However, the professors shut down my offer. 
Since the teachers felt responsible for the student's safety, they did not want them to go on the risky adventure. Canyoning in the dark is extremely dangerous and could potentially have fatal consequences if one isn't careful. However, the idea was already locked into my mind and apparently one of the gym teachers who happily agreed to go with me. Since the water in the canyon was going to be colder than it was earlier that day, the gym teacher completely covered himself up with his wetsuit. Only the front part of his face was exposed. I simply went in shorts. I was feeling great after the bottle of wine, and within a couple hours, we were running over the stony path toward the canyon. The canyon looked very different at night. The trees and the rocks cast immense shadows against the earth. It wasn't intimidating, just different. As we arrived at the beginning of the canyon, we saw nothing but a black hole. There was no light in the canyon whatsoever, only darkness. I told Tom, the gym teacher, that if we abseil the first rock, we're going to have to go all the way through. There would be no turning back. After a moment of hesitation, he replied, Yeah, let's go. As we were descending into the black abyss, I felt different. It was a completely different experience than what we had encountered earlier that day. Specifically, my senses were very alert, and I was just aware of everything. Even though we were surrounded by darkness, I just I knew the canyon by heart and could visualize where each rock and crevice was on the path. Although we could not see, we listened very carefully to understand how the water stream was moving. We followed the current silently and only spoke to each other to detect the distance between our bodies. As our voices echoed against the rocks, we noted that it would be best to stay no more than two meters apart from each other. It was a great experience just being there in the dark with Tom. We as humans normally rely on our sight to guide us, but both Tom and I realized that instead we could listen and feel our way through the canyon. We were tapping into and just relying on a different part of our brain. Due to our new enhanced state of mind, we were able to make alterations to help us continue to stay alert. It just was all natural. A conditioned mind can cause narrowed perception, especially when only focusing on one sense and rarely using the others. Also, it's not about simply using them. It's about forming your entire perception through those other senses. Subsequently, you can begin to see the world in a different light. Tom and I discovered this as we spoke during our progression through the canyon. Everything was going smoothly and we were really enjoying ourselves. The water was no longer cold as I had adapted by now and my senses were sharp. As Tom and I followed the current, our surroundings emitted a tranquil feeling. We had just arrived at a crucial spot in the canyon and though we were in the dark, we weren't blind. We found ourselves on a rock that the only way for us to get down was to jump. Now, if we jumped too far, we would slam into boulders. Luckily, I knew exactly what to do. I made some calculations in my head and just was ready to jump. Tom, on the other hand, wasn't as familiar with the train, so I thought it would be best to give him explicit instructions. Listen very carefully to where I enter the water. That way, you know how far and how hard you have to push off the wall when you do it yourself. He nodded with a little hesitation, but he told me he understood. Since there is no light, he would have to listen very carefully to the sound of my feet as they enter the water. His hearing would have to be sharp and model that of a submarine's radar. He would have to trust me if this was going to work. Without any further delay, I jumped. After a large splash and submerging a few feet under the water, I took two strokes to bring me up on the slippery surface. Tom, did you hear the distance? Yes, he answered. I could still sense the hesitation in his voice, but he was now determined to jump. There was no other way. A few seconds later, I heard him take a step and then leap into the darkness. He entered the water right next to me and surfaced a moment later. Is everything okay? I asked. <sighs> yes, Tom said with a relieved tone. His trust in me and the way he surrendered to the situation is what ultimately led him to success. He could not have done it otherwise. Letting go of his anxiety and freeing himself from hesitation was also extremely helpful. Obstacles in life consume energy. And because Tom and I were able to overcome those obstacles in our way, we experienced a new type of energy. We felt powerful and full of vigor as we continued on. As we approached the final part of the canyon, moonlight began to peek through the rocky walls. It was a beautiful sight as we began to regain our vision and realize what we had just accomplished. A few minutes later, we were out of the canyon and stood motionless in the valley. Our minds were at peace and we felt immense joy. Tom and I embraced each other without saying a word. We had met a great challenge and conquered it. By the time we reached where we were staying for the night, the students and the professors had already fallen asleep. I laid myself down in the bed, closed my eyes, and slept like a rock. The next day, I took the group to another canyon in a warmer area. 
In the Pyrenees, the climate just varies all over the place. It could be very wet and cold in one area, while very hot and dry in another. It all changes. So one must adapt to new surroundings, just as Tom and I had to adapt to master that canyon without light. Chapter 10, Fear by Wim Hof. I have the ability to climb steep rocks without gear and have no fear of falling because I'm always prepared. Subconsciously, my mind just, it clears itself now in its sleep the night before. But I wasn't always like this. When I was younger, I suffered from nightmares. Climbing terrified me, but my persevering through my fears with training and meditation, I was able to make those fears disappear. At first, it started as me finding a rock that I was afraid to climb. I would imagine myself climbing each step, grabbing each hold. Eventually, I would feel that I had climbed it multiple times and knew it like the back of my hand, even though I never actually climbed it. Don't get me wrong, I mean, that doesn't mean my fear completely disappeared, but after imagining it in my head, I began to see it from a different angle. No longer was I intimidated, but I, I felt like a child playing on a jungle gym. I was able to climb it with ease, and, and my mind would just finally feel free from the nightmare. You might be asking yourself, how does this even relate to the cold? Well, let me explain. The rocks can represent any challenge that appears in your life. It may appear impossible to overcome at first, but with a clear head and the will to press on, you will find a way to reach success. Sometimes it, it may be terrifying, but that is something you have to embrace. We are rarely tested when we are afraid of stepping out of our comfort zones. That comfort zone can hold us back from doing something great. So if you think it's possible, try it out. It's in you. It's your mind. Learn to take control of it. In the Bhagavad Gita, they say, the mind under control is your best friend. The mind wandering about is your worst enemy. Make it your best friend to the point where you can rely on it. Your mind makes you strong from within. It is your wise companion. The sacrifices you make will be rewarded. Life doesn't change, but your perception does. It's all about what you focus on. Withdraw from the world's influence and no longer be controlled by your emotions. If you can grab the wheel of your mind, you can steer the direction of where your life will go. Once you can feel the steadiness of the mind, it will convince you that it is the only way to live. Your spirit and willingness to do more with your life will become natural. Happiness and success doesn't come from years of thinking about trying it. It comes from taking action. When you are doing, each step you take will be a firm one. It doesn't matter if you don't succeed. Confidence comes from experience. One of the easiest ways to gain confidence is by finding ways to get around your obstacles. Failure is an option, but what makes you stronger is choosing not to accept it. Hesitation creates fear, increasing the likelihood that you won't follow through. So if you can, don't hesitate. Becoming spiritual isn't about staring at a candle for hours or repeatedly saying asanas or mantras. It's about you expressing yourself. Believe in yourself and know you have what it takes. Let go of all the doubt and anything in your life that is causing you stress. At times, the feat may seem impossible to you, too impossible for you to reach. I guarantee you that this is not the case. It is a matter of finding a way to make it possible. In the beginning, that's all that matters. All who are willing to seriously consider the possibility that there's more to life than what is already in the textbooks are capable of being the innovators that this generation will write about. Cleansing yourself of your emotion can take time. So be patient. It may feel like you're losing a part of yourself in the process, but that is only temporary. In time, that feeling will turn into clarity. The people that I know that have experienced this change have never regretted their actions. They can now see the potential in their lives, whereas they could only before see the limits. It is truly a magnificent transition. I won't lie to you. It does take practice and perseverance. Make it simple for yourself by calming your mind from anger, understanding what makes you sad, and replicating the experiences that make you happy. If you want strength and success, just do it. Chapter 12, Half Marathon in Lapland by Wim Hof. For a small portion of my life, I worked as a postman. It was my job to drive boxes, letters, parcels, and advertisements to post offices so that they could then be delivered to their specific locations. I worked alone during the nights. The solitude gave me time to reflect on past events and encouraged deeper thinking. One day, while I was driving down the road, I received a phone call from a Canadian producer representing the Discovery Channel. He asked if I was interested in doing a challenge in the cold. I listened very attentively as he explained his proposition. I held back my excitement and calmly told the gentleman, yes, I'd love to. 
He told me he would send me an email soon and that I should reply at my convenience. I ended the call and continued my work as a postman. I was thrilled. The excitement lasted all day. As soon as I got home, I turned on my computer and checked my email. The message was already sitting in my inbox. It explained that the challenge would be the center of attention for a documentary. The event would take place just beyond the polar circle. At that time, it was November, and the challenge was set to take place in January. The only thing we had left to figure out was the type of challenge that I would pursue. I had already swam under ice and ran a half marathon on the slopes of Everest. However, my run was only filmed by Dutch television and wasn't internationally broadcasted. So, I sent an email back to the producer and explained that I could run a barefooted half marathon beyond the polar circle. It fit their expectations perfectly. Weeks went by, and December came, and I hadn't done any training whatsoever. As the date of the challenge approached, I became really tense, as I normally do. It's a natural reaction that occurs when the mind worries. To ease my mind, I decided it was time to start my training with a run. Since it was my first run in a long time, I only ran 1.5 kilometers, which is about 0.93 miles. It was just a quick jog around the neighborhood where I lived. The following day, I went for a 7 kilometer, which is a 4.3 mile run. I felt a little sore afterward, so I didn't run for the next two days. Instead, I went for a cold water swim to relax and regain my energy. The third time I ran, I ran barefooted next to a lake. I ran back and forth on a wooden boardwalk along the shore. It was cold and windy that day, so no one was around when I did my run. It was nice to be able to run in peace. I didn't stop my run until blisters developed on the bottom of my feet, and by that point, I'd run a total of 22 kilometers, which is 13.6 miles. Over the next week, I simply continued my work as a postman. I would tend to my blisters from time to time and take care of them so that they would heal properly. It was a week of rejuvenation. After I healed, I returned to the place on the shore to run. Once again, it was cold and windy and the solitude was nice. I ran 24 kilometers, which is 14.9 miles, barefooted and developed at least 20 new blisters. When I returned home, I was more than satisfied with my run and knew that in time, my feet would heal. Later that evening, my daughter stopped by my house and asked if I wanted to run a few laps with her around the park. I agreed, and while we were running, I told her all about my new challenge. My legs were feeling great, and after two laps, eight kilometers, 4.9 miles, I felt the urge to run even faster. When we finished, the run had made me so happy that I was extremely confident that the challenge would be a success. I was so overjoyed that I cried. Challenges bring about the true nature within me. It alerts my body and my mind, altering my state of being. It makes me feel so alive. It's like I always say, we can do more than what we think. At those moments, when I encounter a challenge, I become extremely aware of the deeper layers of my soul. Since the challenge was quickly approaching, the camera team traveled to Amsterdam to take a few video shots of where I lived and record the activities that I do on a daily basis. There, we did an interview and took a few shots in a local abattoir, which is a slaughterhouse. Afterward, the camera crew departed for Lapland, Finland, where I would be joining them two days later. Lapland can be a very, very cold place in the winter. The temperature can drop as low as negative 50 degrees Celsius, which is negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Even weak polar animals may die in temperatures this cold. It is really a survival of the fittest. Two days after the crew visited my home, I had to meet them in Helsinki. We then took a flight to Oulu, about 800 kilometers north, 497 miles. It was negative 20 degrees Celsius, negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit outside when our flight landed. While we were waiting for our ride to pick us up, I decided to take off my shoes and try running a kilometer in the snow. It felt great. The snow was in perfect condition for running. My little test made me even more confident for the challenge. The next day, we went to the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health for a cold water experiment. The experiment consisted of me sitting in a cold water basin, which was set up inside of the laboratory. Professor Oksa, a world-renowned cold physiologist, was the man who performed the examination of my body. Oksa had a passion for the outdoors. Though it was not as extreme as mine, it was a pleasure to meet him, and our discussions were rich and fulfilling. Before we even started the experiment, Oksa first carried out a few baseline tests to get a general reading. He saw that I had a very small percentage of substance fat. He explained that it was an interesting discovery because without much fat, I don't have a lot of protection from the cold. He announced that he was excited to see how I would react when exposed to the cold water basin. To prepare for the experiment, the professor connected my body to many different machines. First, he connected me to an echocardiogram. He then gave me a pill to swallow, which would monitor my core body temperature. He also connected a blood pressure cuff to my arm and gave me a mask to measure the acidification of my exhaled breaths. When the cold begins to impact the body, 
The extremities receive less oxygen and acidification begins. The more conditioned the body is to the cold, the less the body will be affected. The vital organs need to have the body operating at 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to function properly. If the temperature drops even a couple degrees below this, the body will begin to shiver and the blood will shunt from the extremities. That's when the core temperature really begins to be affected. The core temperature of the body shouldn't drop below 35 degrees Celsius, which is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Otherwise, the body will be more likely to suffer from hypothermia, which can damage the liver, lungs, heart, and brain. When cold flows through vital organs, the body slowly becomes dysfunctional. The heart beats irregularly, thinking processes and reflexes are slowed down, and breathing becomes more difficult. When the blood temperature drops to about 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the body begins to shut down. During this time, the vital organs could begin to fail. The heart could stop beating, and one would have the potential of falling into a coma. Ultimately, these final consequences could lead to death. The specialists who research the cold say that sometimes people can appear dead when they're pulled out of the water while they're really in a comatose state. Sadly, sometimes people will attempt to warm up hypothermic victims too quickly, and this alone can cause the person to go into shock and die. We move the experimentation process to the basin. I was seated on a motorized chair, which was controlled by a remote control in the hands of Professor Oksa. There, I would be lowered down into 8 degrees Celsius, 46.4 degrees Fahrenheit water. When we finished up the connections, Dr. Oksa reviewed the monitors one last time, and we were ready to go. He began lowering me into the water, and the immersion began. Dr. Oksa's first reaction was surprise. He was astonished that I had no gasping reflex when I first entered the water. It meant that the veins around my core had immediately closed and that they were conditioned very well. My adaptation to the cold was excellent. Minutes passed and my core temperature stayed the same. After 10 minutes, Oksa noticed that my core temperature actually rose. He thought this was a remarkable change in my body. The powerful thing about the experience was that everything felt under control. I felt great. My attention was positioned toward a point on the wall in front of me. It helped me stay focused in my mind so that I could stay warm. As a result, my core temperature remained stable despite the freezing cold water. Since I was feeling comfortable, I decided to enjoy it. I began asking the professor questions about his life and his hobbies. Later on, I realized that this caused me to lose my focus, which is what had been maintaining my core temperature. After 25 minutes, my core temperature had fallen 0.5 degrees Celsius, 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit, and Dr. Oksa decided to end the experiment. It was stupid of me to lose focus like that, but I now know that it's important to always pay attention and remain centered. Cold water can be merciless, and if you aren't paying attention, you can quickly lose control of the situation. Therefore, always remain focused and attentive. After the experiment, the crew stayed to interview the professor. He stated his findings and said that he believed that I'd be able to successfully complete the half marathon due to my extraordinary control that I had demonstrated in the cold water experiment. After we completed our mission in Olu at the Institute, we went back to the hotel and I enjoyed a nice, warm sauna. The next day, we left for Kalari, where I would run the barefooted half marathon. The temperature had dropped to negative 30 degrees Celsius, negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. When we arrived, we stayed in a wooden lodge where we did a few shots of the arrival for the documentary. There were only two days left until the run, so we prepared the itinerary and scheduled the sleds that would carry the film crew. Before we knew it, the day to run was upon us. Everything was set and ready to go. Both local and national journalists were present for the event. As everyone was preparing for the event to begin, I noticed the starting line was covered with reindeer skin. It appeared as if it was some sort of primordial spot, as if the skin was placed there in an attempt to bring back the prehistoric men. I stood at the starting line and gazed out into the horizon. It was time. I took a deep breath, let out an excited yell, and took off. While running over the snow and ice barefooted and in such frigid temperatures, I honestly didn't know how it would end. My expectations were that I would complete the event with no problem, but I stayed very alert. I stayed in a place where I had heightened awareness. As I knocked away kilometer after kilometer, everything felt fine. Physiologically speaking, I was in control. After 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles, I checked myself over in my head. My mind was strong, limbs felt great, and my core was warm. There was nothing to be concerned about, so I just continued on. I even made jokes while I was jogging, sometimes speaking to the camera crew as they were recording me from the sled. I did this with caution though, so I could make the experience different from the laboratory and remain in control. When you exert energy through talking, it's like opening a door and letting the cold air into a house. If you hold the door open for too long, the house will lose all of its heat. I made sure I didn't leave that door open for too long so that I could remain focused on my body and succeed. While I continued on, the chemistry in my body was working just fine. 
I had no problems whatsoever. The journalists were confident that I was going to make it. That's when something began to change. I just began to feel difficulties in the front part of my left foot. I didn't know what was going on, but I could sense that something was wrong. It continued to get worse and worse until my whole foot resembled that of a wooden stick. I couldn't feel it anymore. This was all happening right as I was passing the 18 kilometer mark, 11.1 miles. There were only three more kilometers to go, 1.8 miles. I decided to just do it. Step after step, breath after breath, I made my way forward and eventually I saw the finish line. It was another spot that was covered with reindeer skin, just like the beginning. I'm going to make it, I thought. The last 200 meters of my run were beautiful. As I came closer, the sun broke through the trees and lit up the sky. It was a magical coincidence. While nearing the finish line, I gazed up at the sun. My gold medal hung in the air before me. You know, at the time, I didn't know what kind of sacrifice I was making to finish the race, but it opened a door to a devastating problem, a problem that would take me weeks to recover from. So after the race, we went directly to the local hospital. The dermatologist there told me that I had third degree frostbite. I showed my foot to the cameras so that everyone could see what I put my body through to complete that race. And then I returned to Holland on crutches. Chapter 13, Frostbite by Wim Hof. Soon after the dermatologist told me that I had done irreparable damage to my foot, I was given a box full of medication. He had said that the damage was inflicted on the front part of my left foot and advised that I take the medication to keep it dry. He had also emphasized that it was very important to keep my foot from getting wet. By the time I returned to Amsterdam, the color of my foot had turned to a dark, greenish-brown shade. It was a devastating sight. I couldn't sleep. I sat in my living room thinking about what could be done. I knew there had to be a solution to my problem. I wasn't going to just accept that my foot was irreparably damaged. No, I'm not going to take it, I thought. I was so frustrated that it just filled me with rage. Something inside of me began to fight from that moment on. I was thinking about what the doctor had said about not getting my foot wet when a strange idea came over me. Cow balm. You know, it's that grease that they apply to cure a cow's irritated udders. Even though it's the opposite of what the dermatologist advised, I thought, if it could help the irritated skin of a cow, it might be able to help my foot. It was at that point my fight to heal began. With a newly found determination, I lay down in my bed and slept like a rock. And the next morning, one of my friends went to the store for me and purchased the cow balm. I began to grease my foot and left no area dry. I felt that it was the right thing to do despite the doctor's orders. I visualized myself getting better and stayed very attentive to my foot. A couple of days later, television cameras came by to put the Iceman's terrible looking foot on television. On the outside, it was green and black. But on the inside, the healing process was beginning. While tending to my foot, I thought about what I had been able to achieve. With the help of the Discovery Channel, I was now known as the guy who ran a half marathon beyond the polar circle, barefoot in the snow. Looking back on my success that day, I am reminded of an old story I once heard. The story of three brothers. Over a century ago, in the northern part of Finland, there lived three brothers. There was a sauna in a wooden hut near a large frozen lake 10 kilometers from their village. Every day, the three brothers would travel out to the sauna and enjoy its warmth. One day, a sudden rush of flames interrupted their relaxing sauna time. Something had caused a fire inside of the wooden hut. They looked around but couldn't find a way to extinguish the flames. The three brothers escaped from their wooden hut with only their lives. The fire had consumed their clothes and belongings. It was a large fire that could be seen from afar. It was beautiful and warm, yet, of course, tragic and unexpected. Naked, the three brothers were forced to run 10 kilometers through the snow in the freezing cold of the night to get home to their village. The story of these three brothers shows that my marathon was nothing spectacular. The barefoot run was just my way of showing the world that we're all capable of doing more than we had previously thought possible. It is a memorable story, and so is mine. News of my achievement spread all over the media. Despite my damaged foot, I was a real hero in the eyes of the public. I didn't care about the media attention. My focus was on healing my foot as fast as possible. Back in December, right before I started training for the half marathon, I received a phone call from a man who was preparing for an expedition on Mount Everest. He was the team leader and wanted to know if I was interested in the ascent. Their idea was for me to climb Mount Everest wearing only shorts and sandals. It was another opportunity to do a challenge that no one had ever done before. I was very interested and therefore had accepted the offer. What I didn't know at the time was that just a month later, I would have irreparable damage done to my foot. 
Initially, the sponsoring for the expedition just wasn't going well. Having just completed a world record and receiving a lot of media attention related to the frostbite, the money started flooding in from all directions. 50,000 euro here, 50,000 euro there. It was flowing in and coming together. This, however, did not change the condition of my foot. I had three months to recover. The dermatologist told me that there was no chance that I would be able to make that climb or even have slightly recovered by then. I decided to throw away all the medication and increase my fighting spirit to heal. I started to grease up my foot on a daily basis. I remained optimistic that it would help my foot get better. Now, despite everything the doctor said, one month later, my foot was healed. The dead, callous skin had vanished and new, healthy skin turned my foot into a new one. It was like the injury had never happened. To help promote the Everest expedition and the sponsors for the event, I actually stood in a box full of ice as a publicity stunt. My event appeared in newspapers, in magazines, on television, and even in the marketplace, where huge banners hung to advertise the expedition. It was all part of the game, and I was just along for the ride. Eventually, the day to depart for Everest finally arrived. Chapter 15, Everest by Wim Hof. On April 1st, 2007, we left for Everest. We took a flight to Dubai and connected to Kathmandu. News of my approaching arrival was booming. Some guy from Holland is going to climb Everest in shorts. The news was everywhere. My philosophy was Hillary and Tenzin did it with clothes and oxygen. Messner did it without oxygen. I will try it without oxygen and without clothes. It was a very controversial matter, but it spread throughout the news all over the world. The journalists were waiting for us as we arrived at the airport in Kathmandu, Nepal. There I was, back in Nepal with the new team. As we drove through the crazy traffic in the streets, cars honked all around us. The expectations were high and this affected me but I didn't let my feelings show. Instead, I held it inside, which only made me think of all the things that could go wrong. I reminded myself that the only thing I could do was just be ready and the rest would follow. My main concern was my body. I needed to focus my nervous system, immune system, blood circulation, heart, and mind, just to bring them all together. I also did a lot of my own personal research by speaking to the local Sherpas. They are very wise and know the mountain like the back of their hand. They told me, We'll see how much you can do. Even though it will be a long hike, you seem fast and strong. After they witnessed me performing my technique during one of my training sessions, they approached me with questions. I decided to spend some time with the Sherpas until the day I left for Everest arrived. The Chinese authorities greeted us as we passed the border. We then drove down the Friendship Highway toward the Tibetan Plateau. From there, it was only a 4,000 meter drive, which is 2.5 miles. We planned to stay in the village for a couple days so our bodies would be able to acclimatize. Along with buying large portions of food for the trip, we played football to help condition our bodies to the new climate. To further practice and prepare our bodies for the ascent, we also climbed nearby mountains. Before we knew it, the day was upon us when we would leave for the Everest base camp at 5,200 meters, which is 17,060 feet. We packed our jeeps and hit the road. Along the way, we passed all kinds of Tibetan villages and rocky pastures. After some time, we stopped at Rongbuk Monastery at 4,800 meters, which is 15,748 feet. We filmed there for a bit, but didn't stay too long because we didn't want to intrude on the people that lived there. After an hour or so, we returned to our jeeps and continued our drive to the base camp. Finally, we were there, the base camp of Mount Everest. Komolungma, Chinese for Everest. Sagamatha, Hindi for Everest. Here, we would stay to acclimatize for days, Tents surrounded us. They weren't all just sleeping tents either. There was a huge kitchen tent where everyone cooked, a tent where people could purchase items and supplies, a showering tent, a tent to eat in, and an office tent where you could reserve your place on the grounds. After we had found our spot and settled in, I went exploring in the adjacent mountains. Everything went well and I was excited for the things to come. When I got back to camp, I started playing the blues on a guitar. Many people heard it and came over to listen. Afterwards, we played football again. Though, with half as much as oxygen in the air, it was hard to run for extended periods of time, so we didn't play it for very long. It is important for one to relearn his body's limits in a new environment. When the team leader felt that the group was acclimatized enough, he decided it was time to go to the interim camp at 5,800 meters, 19,028 feet. I told the leader that we should look at the weather forecast before we left. I just had a feeling that it was going to snow in the early afternoon. Since I was climbing the mountain in shorts, I just wanted to make sure the weather conditions were perfect. This is where we hit our first snag. In my opinion, I think the leader's decision to leave when we did wasn't a very good one. As we departed from base camp, the clouds began to cover the sky. The team leader told us to keep going while the clouds only became denser. 
When we arrived at 5,400 meters, which is 17,716 feet, the snow began to fall. I told the group that the overall pace was just too slow for me. I'm a lot faster when I'm in my rhythm and I needed to follow what my body was telling me. So I continued on, in shorts, at my own pace, a fast pace. The head Sherpa tried to get a hold of me and slow me down, but I was ignited by my drive. Finding a good pace can be the key to continuing strong. It's also important to just watch how much oxygen you're consuming. You don't want to waste all of your energy and have to stop for breaths to recover. After a couple of times doing this myself, I realized it wasn't efficient. By monitoring your breathing and making sure you never push past your breaking point, you can continue on for hours at a steady but strong pace. The snow began to fall even harder, and soon my visibility became limited. I couldn't see the path. It was my first time, in shorts, at an unknown height in an unknown place where blankets of snow covered the rocky terrain. Intuition and drive were my only companions. I felt surprisingly good despite the situation and continued my pace up the mountain trail. I was in the snow for hours. The limited visibility reminded me of my solitude, but I still felt remarkably well. I looked ahead of me and saw the outline of an object through the snow. As I came closer, the shape widened out and I realized it was a tent. When I was about a meter away, I saw a few Tibetans staring at me. They were astounded at the Caucasian man who had just emerged from the blizzard wearing only shorts. They invited me inside their tent, gave me some tea with sugar, and placed a blanket around my shoulder. After three quarters of an hour, the head Sherpa arrived and looked in awe at me in total control of the situation. He was worried for me because he was responsible for everyone in this party. Yet, I was absolutely content. I felt that I had shaken hands with Everest's nature. I had connected with the mountain and its people. I overcame my fear of the unknown, and my anxiety had vanished. I also was able to see how fast I could move without acquiring any form of mountain sickness. The confidence I gained in my inner nature made me feel that I was on the path to accomplishing a lot more on that mountain. I had optimistic thoughts and felt fully capable. After eating in another tent across the riverbed, we returned to our sleeping quarters and fell asleep at our 5,800 meter mark, 19,028 feet. I was ready to take on new steps for mankind. The next day, our team leader had us acclimatize more by climbing in the neighboring areas. We climbed and walked over a small path toward 6,000 meters, 19,685 feet. It was the highest point I had ever been on a mountain. It was also my personal record for highest altitude while wearing shorts. We then returned back to the interim camp. The acclimatization process must have gone well for me because I felt great. It was my personal goal to reach the highest point on Everest and for it to happen in only shorts. I wanted to show that being exposed almost naked in nature is the way it's supposed to be, even the extremes. To me, clothing and artificial oxygen are like using a car to get from point A to point B. Unlike walking or riding a bike, you simply step on the gas and go. Of course, it's still difficult to climb Everest even with auxiliary tools, oxygen, clothing, but doing it the natural way makes things a lot simpler. The following day, we began our climb to 6,400 meters, 20,997 feet. There, we would enter the advanced base camp, ABC, where one can see the beautiful North Coal at its height of 7,060 meters, 23,162 feet. Tenzin, the head Sherpa, and I went ahead of the others because our rhythm and pace were much faster than the rest of the group. As we climbed up the slopes, the leader of the camera team filmed us. Tenzin told the camera that, despite being fully clothed, he was still freezing. He said that he was amazed at how I was climbing in only shorts. This is not something I'm able to do because I'm fast and strong, but because I'm able to fight through my fears and interact with the mountain. Instead, I'm stronger and faster in a natural way, where I remain connected to the environment around me. My senses are more perceptive in the mountain climate where my body is exposed. My mind and body adjust naturally. It's reflexive. We stayed a couple of days at the ABC camp, and we were soon acclimatized. It's fairly easy to tell how well the body has adapted to the environment. All you need to do is monitor the oxygen saturation and heart rate. High oxygen saturation and a low heart rate are the ideal variables to be well conditioned in high altitudes. It seemed that I had both of these in my favor as I had acclimatized extremely well. One of the days at the ABC, I was feeling so full of energy that I decided to climb the North Coal. Driven, I threw on my shorts and jogged over to the base. When I first arrived at North Coal, the wind was really bad. The wind speed was over 100 kilometers per hour, which is over 62 miles per hour. Of course, when you're wearing shorts and wind speeds that high, you can really feel it against your skin. I stayed there for an hour, but decided that it wasn't wise to go up any further. 
I had no choice but to abort. I was disappointed, but I knew I would be back soon to try again. Later on, I returned to North Cole with Tenzin. His pace was just too fast and I was desperately trying to follow up. What happened? I was faster than him when we were hiking to the interim camp, but now his speed had far exceeded my own. It soon was obvious who was more acclimatized in that terrain. While trying to keep up with him during the ascent, I collapsed regularly while trying to catch my breath. I was exhausted. Slowly but surely, I fought my way up until I reached the peak of North Cole at 7,060 meters, 23,162 feet. It was my new personal record in shorts. At the peak, we set up flags around the area, including a flag of a poet, Rob Tuakana, who is a dear friend of mine. Another flag we raised with a United World flag, which exemplified enlightened beings as the world's inhabitants. On the flag was a big sun with bright beams, symbolizing the equality of human beings. It was beautiful. Lastly, we took some pictures for our sponsors. After we got a few good shots of the necessary material, we were content and headed back down to ABC. We passed the news over satellite telephone to inform the world of our recent achievement. We found out the next day that we had made international news. The headlines read, Iceman reaches North Coal, and who can stop the Iceman? All was going well. After several more ascents up North Coal, I felt more acclimatized. Everyone was very impressed by my agility, speed, and endurance. Also, the frequent checkups with the medical team showed that my oxygen saturation was high and my heart rate stayed low, which is perfect. One day, after returning from North Coal, the team leader decided to go down a little to recover before the final ascent of Everest. It was a strategic way to ascend. We were so used to the thin air of the higher altitudes that at 4,600 meters, 15,091 feet, that the air felt thick. We stayed there for three beautiful days, barely eating anything. When you're in high altitudes, your appetite is limited. The higher you climb, the more your body shuts down the non-essential functions to preserve energy for your vital organs. It's survival mode. When we were completely recovered and felt refreshed, we went back to the ABC and then began traveling up to the 7,060 meter mark, 23,162 feet at the North Pole. We spent the night there and then left for the next marker. We made it up to the 7,200 meter mark, again, 23,622 feet, and it was here that I had again accomplished a new personal record in shorts. Finally, the day came for us to ascend up to the 7,800 and 8,300 meter marks, which is again, respectively, 25,590 and 27,230 feet. Here, the Sherpas had set up a few tents for us. There were also oxygen bottles waiting for us, which we were to use when summiting. That day, I felt great and went up the slope very fast. I ascended 200 meters in one hour with Tenzin. Then I realized that something was wrong. I felt something going on inside of my left foot. That frostbite injury that I had developed in Finland was healed, but apparently the veins were just not as conditioned as they used to be. The entire circulation system, as well as the veins, has to be able to constrict and dilate to be able to adjust to the cold and altitude. Whenever there is less oxygen in the air, the veins in the extremity naturally close to conserve heat and redirect blood flow to the core to preserve the essential organs. Then, after adaptation, the veins open up again and the extremities are filled with warm blood. However, due to my recent cold injury, the veins in my left foot weren't opening. There was a tight pressure and I began to feel pain. I could feel that the veins in my foot weren't going to open back up again, so I was forced to turn around. There wasn't a doubt in my mind that if I didn't turn back at that moment, I would lose my foot forever. I was not going to make that same mistake twice. Even though the expedition cost us 250,000 euro, which at the time was about $340,000 to $350,000, and completing this challenge would have brought me everlasting honor, being the only man to ever climb Everest in shorts, it was not worth losing my foot over. I decided to think rationally and listen to what my body was telling me. I looked around on the roof of the world and felt satisfied with what I had accomplished. I had fought through my fears and set a new record height of 7,450 meters, 24,442 feet in only shorts. The press brought the story and the pictures of the expedition to the entire world. I returned to Holland and prepared for my next attempt. In a month's time, I was going to attempt a Guinness World Record in a polar bear compound. By the time I got home, I felt completely rejuvenated and healthy in both body and mind. My foot thanked me for being able to take some time to heal altogether. Remember, we can do more than we think, but only when we break through the inhibitions of fear and other obstacles. Rationality keeps us alive. Chapter 17, USA by Wim Hof. 
I first met Eric Mazur in Los Angeles when I was invited by a Guinness World Record show to break the existing ice endurance record by half an hour. Eric was an independent documentary producer who did a lot of specials that aired on television. We had spoken a lot through email prior to meeting in person because he was interested in releasing a story on some exciting footage for Ripley's Believe It or Not. The emails were always warm and friendly, and when I arrived in LA, he offered to show me around the city. While I was in LA, I broke the record by half an hour, as I said I would, which brought the new world record to one hour and 34 seconds. Feeling great about my accomplishment, Eric took me out to sea to show me some great views. We saw Beverly Hills and talked about possibly working together in the future for one of his documentaries. Years later, Eric hadn't forgotten about me. I received an email from him asking if I'd be willing to come to New York City to break the existing ice endurance record. The event would take place in front of the Rubin Museum of Tibetan Art. He wanted me to be a part of a documentary that he was producing on... The Iceman. Me. After catching up, we began planning for New York. I'd never been to New York City before, so this would be my first time visiting the Big Apple. I was excited. When I arrived in New York, I took note of the amazing architecture. New York City is a legendary place with impressive buildings that have astonishing detail. The decorations around the city were very beautiful and inspiring. I set my amazement aside and realized that I was there for a purpose, to break the existing ice endurance record in the streets of Manhattan. An entire Dutch television team accompanied me to NYC, and together, both Eric's camera crew and the Dutch camera crew would be able to get a lot of great footage. Before the event took place, I met with the director of the museum. I also had the opportunity to meet Dr. Kenneth Kamler and Professor William Bouchel. The Rubin Museum of Art and the Today Show hired both individuals for special interviews. Together, they were going to enlighten the audience on my ability to withstand the extreme cold. Ken Kamler, who had recently published a book entitled Surviving the Extremes, was the main speaker during the world record attempt and would be helping to monitor my vitals. He would also be narrating the event to the people watching in the streets and at home in front of their televisions. William Bouchel, or Bill as I call him, is a well-established professor who received his PhD in anthropology. Through a lot of research, he remains connected to the Tibet House. He is most well known for his research on how esoteric Eastern disciplines can affect the Western society. He's attempting to differentiate between the two societies with hopes to find insights that will benefit humanity. Very soon after meeting William, he gave me an extensive booklet exemplifying scientific data related to his research. I really felt honored. Bill, hey, if you're reading this, thank you. Two days after my arrival, I was asked to do a demonstration for the Today Show. Everything was set up in front of the studio and it was a cold morning in New York, and there was quite a lot of wind in the streets. Before stepping into the Perspex box, I did an interview in my shorts. When I got into the box, they filled it up with 700 kilograms, 1,543 pounds of ice. Bystanders were in awe as they watched a normal guy subject himself to extremely cold temperatures. After 40 minutes passed, they opened the box and frozen chunks of ice fell to the ground. I did one last interview with a man who claimed that I was a human popsicle, and then I went into a nearby building to take a nice, warm shower. Later that day, we did more filming in Madison Square. After we finished filming, we all went for a drink to warm ourselves up in a nearby Havana bar. There, I saw myself televised on a big screen TV. I was famous in New York. Since I would be attempting to break the world record at 2 p.m. sharp the following day, we all went back to the hotel and found our own rooms. I wanted to get a good night's sleep before the world record attempt. The next morning, we all had to wake up and go right to a meeting. The Dutch camera team and Eric's camera team were both present. To our surprise, a third camera team had shown up as well. It was a crew from ABC News wanting to do a documentary entitled Medical Mysteries. As if three television teams weren't enough, 15 other stations ended up showing up at the ice endurance record attempt in Manhattan. There were people everywhere. Representatives from countries all over the world had been sent to film my event so that it could be internationally broadcasted. Meanwhile, I just kept to myself and did what I always do. I prepared mentally and focused on the task at hand. In the final moments before preparation for the world record attempt, cameras surrounded the area and took their final positions. I stepped into the Perspex box and I was ready to go. Dr. Kenneth Kamler's future girlfriend, Grana Stewart, hooked me up with some sensors, which would be monitoring my vitals. Soon enough, a team of people poured ice all around me. They poured the ice in until it reached up past my shoulders. It was at this point that they started the large digital clock, which would display the elapsed time. Dr. Kamler and his assistant Granis checked my blood pressure every five minutes to monitor my vitals. They also checked my core temperature and my heartbeat. At one point, my core temperature decreased a little, but never to a dangerous extent. Things were under control. I didn't need the monitors to tell me how my body was doing. I could feel and understand everything that was happening. I know the dangers of hypothermia, 
and I can control my body. So it doesn't get to that point. The bystanders witnessed a man in control. The director of the museum explained, this Westerner is controlling his inner core temperature by using a Tibetan technique called Tumo. This is also known as inner fire. To maintain control over the core temperature, you must influence the body by steering the hypothalamus. You can think of the hypothalamus as the thermostat in our brain. The veins around the core need to remain perfectly closed in order to maintain a 37 degree Celsius, 98.6 degree Fahrenheit body temperature. The blood needs to stay at that temperature to prevent hypothermia and to keep the liver, lungs, heart, and brain from shutting down. While the skin temperature may fall to zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the core can maintain the proper blood temperature to stay alive. At this point, the body can generate heat three times as much as it does when in stasis. Researchers have suggested that because of my cold training, I'm able to control the autonomic nervous system to a certain degree. Normally, people are unable to directly influence the autonomic nervous system, but with proper training, it becomes possible. I am convinced that anyone can learn to do it. This is exactly what I did throughout the record attempt. I remained in control. At the 50 minute mark, I briefly sensed something strange going on in one of my kidneys. It felt cold. Focusing on that spot, I redirected the blood flow to provide heat to my kidney. Within minutes, the sensors in that area detected a remarkable increase of 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Needless to say, it was warm again. After that, Kamler watched a steady line as my core temperature stayed the same. He also watched as my heart rate went up a little. In order to maintain the blood's temperature, the heart rate must go up to warm the body. With that being said, the heart rate is something that should be carefully monitored to make sure that the situation doesn't become life-threatening. If my heart rate had exceeded 200 beats per minute, we would have immediately stopped the record attempt. Luckily, my heart rate never rose above 130 beats per minute. Even at 130 beats per minute, I was still able to generate enough heat and energy to circulate around my body to keep it warm. I looked at the large digital clock to see how much time had elapsed. There was only one minute left until I would set the new record. As the last 10 seconds approached, the crowd yelled in unison, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. I broke out of the box and threw my arms up in the air in triumph. I did it. After a nice warm bath, I did an interview with Ken Kamler in front of the audience. It was quite the presentation. The news of my new world record traveled quickly throughout the media and all around the world. That evening, people even recognized me as I was walking down the streets in New York. It was a surreal feeling, being a celebrity. I'd seen a lot of television programs in my life, but now I felt like I was a part of it. I dared again and didn't meet failure. My confidence took a step forward and I was ready for more. After my successful record, someone arranged a meeting for me to meet with Dr. Kevin Tracy of Feinstein Institute of Manhasset, New York. Apparently, Dr. Tracy was extremely interested in performing research to see if I could influence the immune system. I didn't know what to expect, but before I knew it, we were in a subway on our way to Manhasset. It was about 35 kilometers, 27.9 miles away. On the ride over, I had a very interesting discussion with Professor Bouchel, a modest gentleman who is extremely dedicated to science. Bill and I spoke of the potential benefits of cold exposure and how it could help individuals of the Western society. Many diseases are caused by bad circulation, which can be extremely uncomfortable. We discussed many ways that the cold exposure could possibly help alleviate the problem. Bill and I shared many similar beliefs and ways of thinking. It was a good conversation for the ride to Manhasset. After getting off the subway, we jumped on a bus, and before long, we arrived at the front gates of the Feinstein Institute. As we were entering the Institute, the employees informed us that it was prohibited to record anything during our visit. We said we understood, and they led us to a large conference room where 12 individuals were seated around a large table. After all the introductions, I began telling the group about my vision of how using the cold correctly could greatly benefit humanity. They were all interested in what I had to say, so they listened attentively. From the conference room, we all went down to the testing room, where I sat in a cozy chair connected to a lung monitor and cardiogram. During the test, they actually had to switch out the lung monitor twice because they thought it wasn't working properly. When a lung monitor doesn't sense any air or breaths at all, it reads the person connected as dead, and I went without breath for longer than two and a half minutes. After switching to the third monitor, I figured it'd be best to stop my breathing exercises. Dr. Tracy's team was also interested in watching my body work at the cellular level, so they extracted blood before, during, and after my experiment. The biochemical specialists planned to identify and compare 310 different blood values from the three samples. After we finished the testing, we thanked Kevin Tracy and his team of specialists for the invitation. We made our way back to the entrance where the bus was waiting for us. We said goodbye and returned to New York City. Just as soon as we had returned to New York City, we had to leave again. 
We flew from JFK Airport in Queens to St. Paul, Minnesota. As I mentioned a while ago, ABC News was shooting a documentary entitled Medical Mysteries, and this was where the filming would be taking place. When we touched down in St. Paul, you could see how cold it was outside by looking through the plane's windows. Everything looked icy and there was snow everywhere. The temperature read negative 30 degrees Celsius, 22 degrees Fahrenheit. It was like I was in Lapland again. It was so cold that the local elementary and high schools were canceled because of the weather. My hotel room was on the 26th floor surrounded by skyscrapers. It's what you'd expect from a popular city. I got some sleep and the next morning the camera crew knocked on my door and asked if I would mind if they did some filming. I told them, of course not, that's why we're here, isn't it? The camera team started their filming by having me do some meditative postures. I also did some breathing exercises and some physical exercises. They got some good footage and it also helped me prepare for the rest of the day. And out of nowhere, Joe Anger, who was leading the team, sporadically had me go outside. He wanted me to mingle with the public out in the snowy weather, in my shorts, so that he could record me asking people questions about the cold just to gather their opinions. We recorded and interviewed with people all day long at the university, in the streets, and in the parks. At the end of the day, we took a car to Duluth, Minnesota. There, we met up with two world-renowned medical professors. They wanted to perform a cold experiment to measure the physiological changes in my body. When we arrived in Duluth, we checked in to a cozy hotel and found our rooms. At the hotel, we were greeted by one of the professors who would be performing the experiment. He seemed like a nice guy, and I was excited for the experiment to come. After a good night's rest, we traveled to the medical school where the professor taught. We met in a laboratory that specifically studied the cold's effects on the body. In the lab, the camera crew poured some ice into a basin full of cold water. They hoped the ice would exaggerate how cold the water was so that people at home would see that the water was truly freezing. Filming can be a challenge sometimes. It really can test your patience with the amount of time that it takes to set up the equipment, to get the proper shots, and take down the equipment. Well, that's television. Finally, the cold experiment was ready. They hooked me up to all kinds of wires in order to monitor my vitals in the cold water. Once again, while getting into the freezing water, I had no gasping reflex. As time progressed, my core temperature and my heart rate stayed the same. It looked like it would be another successful experiment. When we finished the experiment, the researchers were more than happy with the results and indeed declared the experiment a success. We then flew back to New York, pleased with our accomplishment. After arriving, we went to the frozen shore off of the Hudson River to do a little more filming. We were happy with the footage we captured there, so we were able to relax for a bit. A strenuous week had gone by, and we had all done extremely well. When I got back from Minnesota, I was anxious to receive a call from Ken Kamler with the results from Dr. Kevin Tracy's experiments. Kamler finally called and informed me that even though Dr. Tracy was typically a very docile and calm man, he literally jumped in the air when he saw the results. The results showed that I had suppressed the inflammatory marked bodies in the nervous vagus. This meant that I had consciously influenced my immune system, something widely seen as impossible. If one's able to influence the immune system by will, it could potentially have an enormous impact on humanity for the fight against disease. So from that point on, my new mission in life was to help people fight disease. Half an hour later, after receiving the good news, I received a phone call from my wife with some very heartbreaking news. She informed me that my mother had just passed away. And with this news, it took me back to the story of my birth. Many years ago, when my mother was pregnant with my brother and I, the doctors actually had no idea that she was carrying twins. After my mother gave birth to my brother, Andre, the doctors took her to recovery room thinking she could relax. And once there though, she sensed that there was another baby on the way. The contractions were strong and my mother screamed for help. The nurse came to check on my mother and she too was convinced that another baby was on the way. The nurse ran back to get the doctor as well as another nurse. Altogether, they pushed the bed to the operating room where they would attempt to do a cesarean section. My mother was extremely hesitant of this kind of delivery due to some of the things that she had heard about in the past, but it was too late now. As a consistent churchgoer and a devoted Catholic, she prayed that her child would make it out alive and eventually become a missionary. Before they could even get my mother on the operating table, she delivered the baby. By sheer will and strength, she was able to deliver her second twin, me. This is how I came into the world. And now, my mother was gone. When I heard the sad news, it felt like someone had punched me in the stomach. I was breathless. There was a hole in my heart. There are no coincidences. Everything happens for a reason. It connects us to those that we love and can provide peace in our heart. In this sad moment, I tried to be strong and carry on with my new mission in life. Chapter 19, Kilimanjaro by Wim Hof. 
Kilimanjaro, located in the middle of Africa, in the country of Tanzania, stands 5,895 meters, 19,340 feet tall. It is Africa's tallest mountain. Jiren, a Dutch cameraman and family friend, were on our way there for a climb. I had arranged a sponsorship deal with Africa Safari and Natural Beauties in Tanzania. Jiren and I boarded a plane in Frankfurt, Germany, and flew to Addis Abeba, the capital of Ethiopia. From there, we took a connecting flight to the Kilimanjaro airport. As we made our descent into Tanzania, we saw Kilimanjaro to our right. It was easily viewable from the airplane windows, and Jiren was able to get a great shot for the footage. Tanzania is a country with a lot of game reserves, Maasai, poverty, and wilderness. Even in rough times, though, most of the people in the area remain nice and have positive attitudes. Wherever we traveled, Tanzanians always greeted us with jambo, meaning hello, every time we passed them. This made me feel very welcomed. My mission in Tanzania was to climb Kilimanjaro, the world's tallest volcano. It would be a lot different from any other mountain that I had climbed before because Kilimanjaro is not a part of a mountain range. It is a freestanding, massive volcano that is almost 6 kilometers, 3.7 miles high. Once we found ourselves in the right area, we were supplied with outdoor gear from a local outdoor shop and a camera from Nikon. Our shelter, which looked like it was left over from the colonial times, was in a secluded lodge. After setting into our rooms, we met our guide for the mountain, John Minja. From a porter to a cook to our transportation, John was in charge of everything. I was able to see the type of person he was from the first moment I met him. I was excited to see what was to come in the next few days. Before long, the day to climb was upon us. We were charged with energy and ready to begin. I became very anxious and excited. I don't like the waiting before an upcoming challenge. My excitement and anxiety caused a drive to succeed within me. This part of me always takes control when I'm climbing. I may not know what will happen next, but I'm always determined to succeed. The drive to Kilimanjaro National Park only took us about two hours and 30 minutes, but it felt longer than that. When we finally arrived at the front gates, some last minute preparations were made. We had to organize permits, divide our supplies, and make our payments. When we passed through the gates, a tropical forest with large trees and wide variety of flowers suddenly surrounded us. There were monkeys in the trees and birds in the sky. Everywhere I looked, it was a beautiful sight. I was most impressed, though, by the large tree ferns that reached 20 meters, 65.6 feet high. They were enormous. That day, we climbed from an altitude of 1,300 meters, 4,265 feet, up to 3,200 meters, 10,498 feet. As we progressed up the mountain, we took notice of how the vegetation changed. Instead of the large ferns and booming wildlife, small trees and bushes surrounded us. The African crew that guided us up the mountain took very good care of us along our journey. Our stomachs were full and our minds were content as we got ready to rest for the night. I'm always eager to climb up as fast as possible, but I know that it's not good to push on an entire crew just to satisfy my desire. So I cooled myself down. We all slept peacefully that night. The following day, we climbed up to 4,200 meters, 13,779 feet, and collected stamps along the way at the checkpoints. At 4,200 meters, the vegetation changed even more drastically. Smaller bushes, different flowers, and strange succulents surrounded us. As we traveled, John, our guide, made our journey extremely interesting along the way. He knew all the plants and trees by name in English, Latin, and Swahili. He was also very intelligent about the wildlife he saw as well. He knew the behavior of all the birds and animals, including what they ate and how strong and intelligent they were. We all learned a great deal from John on our trip. As we continued making our ascent, it began to rain. The rocks and ground quickly became slippery. And due to the rain, our progression slowed and we were soon completely soaked and exhausted from the frictionless ground. Since we were all wet and tired, we headed back to our camp at 4,200 meters and set up our tents. As soon as the rain stopped, we were able to take beautiful pictures of the Kilimanjaro summit and Mount Kenya. The visibility was great with no plants or trees to block our view. Meanwhile, in my mind, I was concerned about the slow pace that we were using to ascend the mountain. I spoke with John about the slowness of the expedition. He saw my determination and desire for speed, so he told me that he and I could ascend the mountain together at 2 a.m. while the others were asleep. I informed Jiren of my plans to summit with John. Jiren, who has a completely different drive and personality than I do, was confused by our drastic change of plans. I explained to him that I wasn't capable of going at such a slow pace and how doing so took me away from the rhythm that I needed to succeed. I was a man on a mission with a powerful drive. Therefore, I was happy that John was willing to help me reach my goal. We barely got any sleep that night because 2 a.m. came around quickly. Luckily, everyone was in a deep sleep as we tiptoed quietly out of the tent toward our unknown adventure. The moon lit up our path surprisingly well. The drowsiness that was with us when we first awoke was gone now that we were using an energetic pace. 
I must admit, I felt better being apart from the group. I was excited to progress at a pace more to my liking. The mysteriousness of the mountain engulfed us as we approached the Western Bridge. The Western Bridge begins at 4,600 meters, 15,091 feet. It is a quick but steep part of the Kilimanjaro Trail. It was covered in snow and very slick. I began to feel the lack of oxygen. and My body felt heavier. I had to force myself to focus on the present and not think about how much more of the journey was left. Willpower and determination pushed me through every step. As we were climbing, I had only one word on my mind. Summit. Since there were no real paths up the mountain, we had to find our own way up the steep side of Kilimanjaro. The climbing seemed to go on forever. It was endless. Dawn came upon us rather quickly, and the massive mountain became much more visible with the light from the sun. However, since we were on the opposite side of the mountain, in reference to the sun, the warmth of its rays couldn't touch us. We pressed on, but without proper acclimatization, it was a lot harder to climb than we had initially anticipated. Even though John regularly climbed the mountain as a profession, he was having a very difficult time too. To reach my goals, I pushed myself to the limit with an incredible drive. John was forced to keep up with my provoked speed. As we were nearing the summit, right before entering a huge crater, we encountered a difficult spot where the rocks and ground are completely covered in ice and snow. Despite its danger, it is a place that provides a marvelous view over Africa. The view provided me with some unexpected joy, despite the throbbing in my head from the lack of oxygen. I did my best to ignore the pain and pressed on as we reached the 5,600 meter mark, 18,372 feet. We were approaching the summit, but it was proving to be an incredible battle. Our bodies were starving for oxygen and were quickly becoming fatigued. Little by little, we ascended up the steep hill toward the summit. Finally, through many breaths and streams of sweat, we reached the Uruhu Peak. We had won the fight. Somehow we generated enough energy to push up to the top despite our deprivation of oxygen. At the top, John and I embraced each other, feeling extremely connected now that we had succeeded together. He had seen me at my weakest, and I saw him at his. The journey was a struggle of two men, John and the Manume Barufu, Iceman in Swahili. For many years, I had an irrational hunger to climb Kilimanjaro, always hearing about people who climbed it. I'd wanted to become one of them, and now I was. Even though it was a lot harder than any other challenge that I had attempted thus far, we had succeeded. Our adventure turned out with a completely different outcome than we had planned. However, it seems that many of my adventures turn out this way. Be expectant of this when you're on your own. Expect the unexpected. The final steps of our adventure were hard, and I could have fallen unconscious many times, but sheer will and determination had been my companions. Due to this, I received a great respect from many porters on the path along the way. Together they sang, Iceman, Iceman, as well as many other songs. I even memorized one of the more famous songs that most porters and guides know. It went like this, Jambo, Jambo Buana. Agorini ni suri sana, wakini magarashua, kilimanjaro hakuna matata. This song tells the story of a stranger who's welcomed. It tells the stranger to do their very best and take life as it comes on the strange kilimanjaro. I enjoyed the meaning of this song, and it made me think about all that I had accomplished. After we took some pictures on the peak, John and I went down the trail to the other side, passing an enormous glacier on the way. Tired and relieved, we continued our way down. I could feel the oxygen in the air increasing more and more as we descended the mountain. I had finally won the battle to get back that oxygen, and I could breathe comfortably again. Since we'd been out all day, I got some pretty bad sunburn on my face. As we arrived back in the camp, Jiren was really shocked seeing me in that shape. He seemed really worried. After explaining our adventures to the others, we gathered up all the rest of our things and descended the mountain together. The next day, we arrived at the south gate of Kilimanjaro National Park. When we got there, a Tanzanian film crew was waiting for us. They had heard that the Iceman climbed Kilimanjaro in shorts in only two days and wanted to hear more about it. When I got back to the Netherlands, there were a lot of television appearances waiting for me. News of the Iceman doing something extraordinary had spread quickly. And my story was on high demand. Soon after my return, the BBC called me, asking if I was interested in doing a challenge in the cold. I suggested a full marathon in shorts in Lapland, Finland. This adventure on Kilimanjaro had given me a lot of confidence, and though I had never attempted a full marathon in shorts before, I was ready to challenge myself again. It would all be mind over matter. Chapter 21, Marathon Beyond the Polar Circle by Wim Hof. Two weeks after Kilimanjaro, I was on my way to Lapland, Finland. After coordinating with an English production company, we came up with the idea to drive from Amsterdam to Lapland for a marathon. Along the way, we drove through Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and then finally landed in Lapland. Each country became colder as we traveled farther north. When we reached the southern part of Sweden, the snow began to fall. Slippery roads and very cold temperatures greeted us, yet we still had another 1,500 kilometers 
932 miles, to travel before reaching the polar circle. Eventually, we reached our final destination. It was a very small resort in Lapland. The place was made out of wood, but it kept us very warm. Outside, wild reindeer frolicked in the thick snow that surrounded us. It felt like a scene right out of a Christmas tale. When the temperature dropped down to negative 20 degrees Celsius, negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit, the condensed air froze, making the snow look like beautiful, sharp diamonds. Shortly after our arrival, we met a local fixer. A fixer, as most television personnel call it, is a person who arranges and plans out many different camera angles at the location of the shoot. While the fixer was attending to the angles, the rest of the crew needed to find a way to make a track for the marathon in the nearby hills. They had to figure out what exactly had to happen and where it would all take place, so it was good that they were very keen on the details. As I watched everyone working, I began to feel very anxious and alert. This is how I always feel before a challenge. It's a natural way to prepare the mind. The next day, we went to a reindeer farm and spoke with the herder. He was dressed in reindeer skin and lived in a typical lapish nomad tent. It looked very similar to that of a teepee, very Indian-like. The lapish nomads are also very similar to the North American Indians. The herder told us stories about their traditions, fire rituals, as well as their life and respect for nature and reindeer. The nomads in the area were diminishing quickly as snow scooters removed the necessity of transport by reindeer, leaving them with no income. I honestly feel that it is a pity to see modern times take over regions like this. One of the stories the herder told us explained how the Lapish people, also known as the Sami, had developed telepathy to speak to the faraway neighbors. However, once the telephones were invented, the telepathy disappeared with time. Another pitiful loss. The next day before the run, we went to the track and did some pickup shots. Pickup shots are the shots that you can't actually shoot when the run is live because the angle is too difficult. So, I took the opportunity to get a good workout in and ran for a bit through the snow, just in my shorts. The snow was neither hard nor soft. It was a different texture than what I had been used to, but I ran for a while through the white, covered wilderness. As I was running, the snow covered the ground in a way that made it hard to see what kind of surface I was stepping on. Everything seemed fine when all of a sudden I stepped on some uneven ground and heard a crick. My right ankle twisted and it began throbbing with pain. The next day was the day that I was supposed to run my first full marathon ever and I had just severely sprained my ankle. My confidence was shattered. Would I even be able to do this marathon? I thought. I was overwhelmed with insecurities and doubts, but the only thing that I could do was continue on with determination, mind over matter. I told the crew that we had to change the track on which I would be performing my run. I explained to them that I had sprained my ankle because the snow was too deep and it would be impossible to run through. They agreed to survey the surroundings and look at some different trails with hardened snow layers. I didn't sleep very well that night, but I was determined and that gave me energy. The following morning before my run, I had to undergo a medical checkup. The professionals told me that my physiology was much healthier than an average young man. They told me that my resting heart rate was extremely low, a 38 beats per minute, with good blood pressure. Then, they saw my ankle. Their suggestion to me was that I should not run the marathon. Of course, I disagreed. They saw my determination and told me that if I chose to run it, it would be at my own risk. So after taping my ankle, the medical professionals wished me luck and sent me on my way. The newspaper and television reporters were present when I arrived at the starting point of the newly plotted course. I mentally prepared myself one last time before getting out of the car. When I was ready, I went outside, had a piss, and started running. I began my run so rapidly that it threw everyone off guard. No one had expected me to begin like that, so everyone had to quickly pack their bags and follow me up in a hurry to catch up. The crew all sat in the back of a car with the rear door propped open so that they could film me as I ran. They were driving a little bit ahead of me at a slow pace so that they can get some good shots. They filmed my feet from close up, far away, from the side, with wide angles and close angles. Everything was going extremely well. Kilometers passed and there were still no problems whatsoever, so I kept running. With everything going so well, my worrying had stopped and I was able to enjoy the environment. My regained confidence helped me relax and enjoy the nature that was in front of me. 10 kilometers went by, 20 kilometers, and I still had no problems. However, when I ran over the 25 kilometer mark, which is 15 miles, the cold began to have an influence on my muscles. The acid that had accumulated in my legs was really slowing me down. This is where the determined mind began to play its role. My mental preparation began to pay off as the run became a challenge of willpower. I pulled myself together and focused on every numbed step through the snow. I would not succumb to fatigue. Remaining focused can pull you through almost anything. It alerts the adrenaline in the nervous system to kick in. 
This run was a fight that I needed to win, just like Kilimanjaro. On Kilimanjaro, my fight was with the lack of air, but there in Lapland, it was the cold in my unprepared physical state. Months before this run, I had prepared myself by sitting in a horse stance with my knees bent over for a half hour to practice getting rid of acid buildup. It took focus, but it worked. This is the kind of focus I had to attain during my run. Despite the heavy feeling that I still had in my legs, I made it past the 32 kilometer mark, 19.8 miles. I stayed in my trance, traveling the long distance through the woods. By the time I reached the last two kilometers, I was almost walking. As my eyes fell upon the finish line though, I regained some of my energy. The final stretch was adorned with cheering people and torches. My goal was now in reach. When I crossed the finish line, I was engulfed in praise. I had done it. After my first full marathon was successfully completed, I was guided into a wooden hut where my family was waiting. They cheered for me when I entered. They sat me down by the fireside and handed me a beer and a cigarette. Like the Indians, I said, a cigarette smoke is for peace and accomplishment. Everyone around me was flabbergasted when they realized that I was a smoker and a drinker. Athletes don't typically have these habits. They were shocked at what I was able to achieve despite my vices. The reporters continued to ask me questions while the film crew reviewed their footage. The run was complete, and I was more than satisfied. I had just taken another pioneering step deeper into my mind. Once again, I was able to overcome my fears and insecurities. That night, when I was relaxing by the television, my run came on the news. It was a beautiful thing to see. The following day, my legs were incredibly sore. I could barely walk. The following three-day car ride was enough time for my legs to completely recover. During the car ride home, I came up with a new challenge that I would like to someday fulfill, to run 50 kilometers, 31 miles, in the Sahara Desert without drinking any water. I hope to accomplish this goal sometime in the future. Chapter 24, Research by Wim Hof. Recently, many articles have been published about the Iceman. The most important discovery that I think is worth talking about is that I'm capable of consciously influencing my immune system. It has been proven at the Feinstein Institute in Manhattan, New York, and now at the hospital in Nijmegen, Netherlands. As you may recall, a few years ago in Manhattan, I performed a meditation experiment at a biochemical research institute. They asked me to meditate at room temperature. The doctors connected me to a lung monitoring system as well as a cardiograph. They stuck a needle in my left arm and withdrew blood before, during, and after the meditation. I had to wait a week before hearing those results. When I received that call from Dr. Kenneth Kamler, I was ecstatic. They found that I was able to suppress the inflammatory bodies influencing the vagus nerve. This means that they found proof that I could directly influence the autonomic nervous system. With this great news, a new fire had started within me. This means that my technique can be a viable way to help cure diseases. The immune system is a powerful source that deals with what makes us sick. If I can do it, so can everyone else. It's just training. Last year, I was invited to the most famous theater hall in Holland by the Circus der Gerachten. They're a platform for innovative thoughts and ideas. They had read one of the articles about my passion to become a dedicated contributor in helping to prevent disease in the world. When I went, I spoke about my interest in finding cures for diseases. The director of the circus had a degree in medicine, and after hearing my speech, we got in contact with the renowned Radboud Hospital in Nijmegen, Netherlands. They organized a meeting with a physiologist named Professor Hopman. Hopman and her team were very interested in performing an experiment on me, so I went with the executives of the circus and drove to Nijmegen. When we arrived at the hospital, I was introduced to many people, including a pleasant Professor Hopman. She escorted me to the laboratory and showed me around. She then introduced me to each member of her research team. Soon after, the tests began. My heart, blood, and veins were all monitored. They also monitored the cold's temperature, as well as my core temperature, lungs, and more. I tried my hardest to give the best possible results. I had wires connected all over my body. Willingly, I entered a Perspex box that they then proceeded to pour ice cubes into. As soon as the ice was up to my neck, the timer began. They checked on me every five minutes, and every 15 minutes, the doctors extracted blood from my veins. The monitors were active, and so was I. Everyone was busy with their particular job, yet everyone was watching me. It felt like I was at the circus again. They all seemed very excited to be experimenting on me. The ice man was sitting in a Perspex box filled with 700 kilograms of ice. I think it was a different experience for them compared to any other experiment they could have been doing that day. They were monitoring an adult male in one of the most extreme situations imaginable. After an hour and a half in ice, I had no problem whatsoever. I was charged up when I came back into the laboratory and it carried on to the end. I gave it my best and I hoped the results would agree. When I was getting out of the ice box, I was struck with regret. I had forgotten to use my breathing technique in the ice. It would have made the results much more significant, but it was too late. So I let it go and hoped that my performance had been enough. 
Everyone was excited. The room was fuller than when I had first entered. Many more professors and doctors from the university must have come in to witness the event. They sat me down in a chair and the afterdrop began to kick in. They noticed my shivering and asked what I was feeling. I then told them that I'm like everyone else. I can sense both the cold and the heat. The only difference between myself and everyone else is that when I focus, I can withstand the cold much more than the average person. After warming up, they let me return to my home to await the results. A week later, we were back at Radboud sitting in Professor Hopman's office. Seated around a large table, we were given sheets that explained the results. Hopman sounded excited. It seems, she said, that you can influence the autonomic nervous system. You were able to maintain your core body temperature at 37.1 degrees Celsius, 98.78 degrees Fahrenheit. You were able to do this while immersed in the ice for an hour and a half. This has never been done before. She continued while pointing at the large collection of books behind her. We can rewrite all of these books in my office and tell that the autonomic nervous system can be influenced by human will. After catching my breath at hearing the astounding result, I told them that I had always believed it was possible. Despite the disbelief of others, I had always known. There was no longer any speculation. The results were sitting in my hand. I then proceeded to look over the results in full detail. The first thing that I noticed was that my blood pressure remained normal the entire time. Normally, when someone is exposed to extremely cold temperatures, the blood pressure dramatically increases to warm up the body. You can call it the survival mode. My pulse also stayed relatively the same. When exposed to the cold, the pulse has been known to double or even triple the normal resting rate. Then while I was submerged in ice, I was able to triple the oxygen density in my body by 300%. By simply standing there without shivering, I was producing three times more oxygen to warm up the exposed parts of my body. This is not a typical physiological reaction. They found that the activity in each individual cell in my body became hyperactive after immersing in ice. Even a week after they took my blood, they were still able to see the activity in my cells. One of the most significant pieces of data was my skin temperature compared to my core temperature. My skin, which was measured by 16 sensors placed at different spots of my body, showed a dramatic decrease in temperature to almost zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Despite the decrease in skin temperature, the core temperature, which normally decreases with the skin, remained at the same temperature, 37.1 degrees Celsius, 98.78 degrees Fahrenheit. The carotid artery, which is one of the major arteries that provides blood flow to the head, showed another remarkable result. Typically, when immersed in the cold, the carotid artery's most important job is to provide blood flow to the brain. Apparently, from the observations made in the experiment, I was able to reverse the blood flowing to my head. A likely hypothesis is that since my head wasn't immersed in the cold water, it didn't need to be warmed up. So by telling my warm blood where to go, I was able to direct the blood flow to the core parts of my body that needed it most. Shortly after the results came in, I came in contact with a man by the name of Professor Mihai Natia, an immunologist. Normally, a peaceful and calm man, when Professor Natia heard the results of the experiment, his body leaked with excitement. He then proposed a new type of experiment to me. He told me that there was a method to show how effective immune systems are by injecting the blood with endotoxin. This endotoxin causes the body to react as if it were poison. This poison provokes the immune system to react violently by releasing cytokines into the bloodstream. Usually, someone injected with endotoxin suffers from nausea, fever, headaches, and an overall flu-like state. This experiment is known as the endotoxin experiment. Now I thought, if I can influence the immune system, Everybody can. That's my goal. It could change how things work in terms of healthcare for people all around the world. Apart from the talk of the endotoxin experiment, immunologists had already begun subjecting me to other kinds of studies. While lying on a bed, connected to all kinds of monitors to watch for heat, blood pressure, and cellular activity, researchers withdrew blood from me 18 times. After an hour and a half of doing nothing, they had me do another hour and a half of my breathing exercises, inducing my meditative state. They sent the withdrawn blood to six different laboratories to measure different things. One of the labs that received the blood was the endotoxin department. However, they were unable to release the results until the endotoxin experiment took place. They didn't want to influence my state of mind. However, there was a slight problem with the endotoxin experiment. The doctors wanted to inject me with endotoxin, but the ages that are allowed to participate in the experiment have to be between 18 and 35, and I was in my early 50s. Even though I'm strong as an ox, I could not get past this age barrier. The doctors who previously saw the results were anxious to prove that the immune system could be consciously influenced. There was a lot of frustration, but we remained patient and persevered. For what felt like ages, we waited. The Ethical Commission administration needed to clear me before I could participate in the experiment. And then finally, after many days, I received a call that would change the world forever. Chapter 26, Workshops by Wim Hof. During my free time, when I'm not attempting new challenges or being tested for research, I give workshops and lectures. I typically give my workshops like I give my speeches. 
I don't have a program. However, I do know the message I want to convey. My techniques, exercises, and methods are the product of my many years of experience in hard nature. I present them in a way that is relatively easy to adopt and understand. It takes more than being able to understand something to experience it for yourself. I tell everyone that they need personal commitment, dedication, and perseverance before attempting any of my cold training. Despite the hundreds of workshops I give each year, I'm still learning ways to improve my method of teaching. Sometimes it can be hard to give people knowledge. Therefore, I attempt to teach people how to experience it. Of course, most of the people are excited at first, but excitement fades. My goal is to make an impression in their mind that lasts a lifetime. So I search for various methods to help convey knowledge, making that impression. In my search to learn how to teach, I found two words that truly explain all of what I believe, trust and conviction. If you don't trust yourself or your body, it's hard to move forward to take risks. If you aren't willing to commit and stick with it, even if you don't encounter failure, your chances are slim if you want to reach your goals. Therefore, I tell you that it is possible to reach the immune system and influence the cardiovascular system as well as the mind. The mind is our seat in which gives us control over the body. Once we learn how to take that seat, we can control the body instead of being subjected to its automatic changes. It's a great feeling when you can consciously experience all of your body's functions working efficiently. We are wholesome beings that strive to feel good and connected. As we're connected to our peers and families, it's just as important to remain connected to ourselves. If your body reacts a certain way, figure out why. Try to understand it. Meditation is also a great way of doing this. It finely tunes your ability to listen to things outside of your worrisome thoughts. To do what Justin and I have done, you need to have willpower, faith, conviction, and deep trust in yourself. If you're willing to expose yourself to nature gradually, you will gain the understanding in time. Disease surrounds us in today's society. It's everywhere. There are too many negative feelings in the world. It is easy to fall victim to living each day blindly, expecting that one day everything will become better, believing that somehow the world will magically be at peace and you will be happy. You have to take action to see changes, and one idea can change the lifestyle of the masses. Even though you may completely understand, it needs to be understood by your body as well. It is a machine that works efficiently when your body and mind are unified and resonate together. If I want to climb vertically up a mountain with no gear, then I need to go deep within myself and make sure that both my body and mind are ready. I need to trust my body in that it won't defy what I ask of it. I also need to trust my mind so that it doesn't bring up negative thoughts. It's about connecting the subconscious and the consciousness of oneself. If a rock slips and I'm in danger, I need to be able to react without thinking. When I climbed Mount Everest in shorts, my faith and trust were with me the entire time. Despite how insane I looked climbing in the blizzard wearing only shorts, I knew I wasn't crazy because my mind was focused and attentive. Yours can be that way too. I'm not that different from everyone else. The only thing that sets me apart is that I choose to embrace the cold while others choose to avoid it. Sometimes when it's cold outside and I'm emotionally exhausted or physically drained, I don't want to embrace the cold. I just want to wear a jacket and be warm. It's not that I don't feel the cold because that's not true. I simply choose to accept it and trust that my body will do its best to adapt. We can do more than what we think. It's a belief system that I've adopted and it has become my motto. There's more than meets the eye and unless you're willing to experience new things, you'll never realize your full potential. To experience what the world has to offer, you have to learn from the greatest teacher on earth, nature. There's an inscription at the local zoo near my house that says, Natura Artis Magistra. It means, Nature is the true artist of life. Do you experience that? Ask yourself, have I ever experienced the wonders of life? Meditate about it. Meditation helps your spirit bloom like a beautiful flower. The experience can be beautiful and great. Poetry is the language of the soul. So listen, life is like a dewdrop on a grass leaf. When it slips away, it's gone forever. This is why we must challenge ourselves to become better and open our minds. We have amazing opportunities to bloom. Understanding can bring us happiness if we're just willing to experience life. My techniques, methods, and exercises have helped people reconnect to their inner nature. It's helped them regain control of their bodily functions and know when there's a problem. My message to the world is this. We have the power to prevent disease. Utilize that ability. Perhaps this illustration will help convey my point. Imagine that there's a big building wherein lays a security guard. Let's say the building represents your body and the immune system is a security guard that protects it. Meanwhile, there's a pyromaniac who's interested in burning down the building. He thinks it's a beautiful sight, but loves to see destruction. Well, if the security guard falls asleep, the pyromaniac has an opportunity to get in. It only takes one small flame to begin the devastation. If the security guard is alert and doesn't need to sleep, then he can constantly protect his property. Only then will this little flame be prevented. 
The immune system has the potential to constantly be alert. It can notice when an intruder enters and instantly send out the forces needed to eliminate the disease. It just takes a bit of training and willpower, but I think it's worth it. It's our body. We have moved too far away from nature and we can't guarantee health. I define being healthy as a wholesome being whose bodily functions run efficiently and keep you happy. To reach this potential, we must be like a hardworking electrician who notices when the power goes out and instantly knows what to do to fix it. My workshops are about challenging your beliefs and building foundations that will help you take care of your body. The cold can do amazing things if you're willing to trust yourself, show conviction, and have faith. When you can reach the point where you're stronger than the cold, you will realize an internal peace behind you because you will understand the power of nature. One more point that I would like to make is this. Do not overthink things. It's good to use our mind when we need it, but it needs to rest too. We can get sick when we don't rest our minds. Psychosomatic things can happen. One of the amazing things about the cold training is that in the moment when you're exposed, you are forced to only think about the present. All of your worrying, all of your stress, all of your problems disappear. If you try to think about other things, the cold brings you back and says, hey, I'm still here. Letting go of your mind like you have to do in the cold is a technique that I try to teach. Your happiness resides in a quiet mind. Sometimes during my workshops, a rush of energy courses through my body. I've been told that people can visibly see when I'm excited because I become very open. I wanna help people experience that energy that is in all of us. It is the source of a free mind, courage, willpower, and faith. The truth is not shallow. The truth goes deep and can penetrate the heart and mind and calm it. Like a pond where the ripples have ceased and the water is still, only then will you see the beautiful treasures below. Like a hint of daylight in a cave, it can generate hope. To be happy, the method and exercise doesn't matter because it's never the same for anyone. For wood carpenters, mechanics, parents, or teachers, they find the love in what they do, and it makes them happy. However you find clarity, as long as it makes you happy, do it. Therefore, do everything with conviction. Believe and trust in yourself, and most of all, be happy. Chapter 28, Texel by Wim Hof. I woke this morning to the sound of whistling birds outside my window, singing a beautiful sonnet comprised of their own chirps and tweets. The time was 4 a.m. It was a windy day in March, but the skies remained clear. I started the day off with my normal breathing exercises, followed by a period of meditation. As I went through my normal routine, I became filled with vigor. Life is wonderful, I thought, when you are disconnected from stress and emotion. On this day, Manelli, Marnix, one of his cameramen, and myself took a ferry to the island of Texel. I was in Texel the prior year to do a workshop, and they asked me to return to do a follow-up. Texel is an island just north of Den Helder. It's a marine base that's located at the shore's end of Holland. The workshop took place in a non-heated stable. The location was empty, save for the participants, and the sheep as our witnesses. Jap, the organizer of the workshop, opened the session by welcoming everyone. After a short speech, he passed the torch off to me. It was my turn. The cold has the potential to boost your energy levels, I said. It can give you a certain type of energy that can fill your body and make you whole. The group formed a circle around me and I became the center of attention. I then explained my breathing exercises and the possibilities that they can open up. You are an open book. Begin to experience the content of the story and try to understand where your life is and where it's going. Each day is a new chapter with new opportunities awaiting you. The stable was really chilly. I could tell that the 15 people surrounding me would begin to suffer if we did not do something soon. So to conserve everyone's energy, I led them outside and began exercising. The grass was soft and the wind was blowing cool air. Soon after we started exercising, I asked them to sit down on the mats that they had brought with them and begin the breathing exercises. After several minutes of breathing exercises, I asked them to perform push-ups. First, I had them try doing push-ups while retaining air in their lungs. Then, I had them try doing push-ups with no air in their lungs. Some were able to do as many as 80 push-ups with air in their lungs, while others were able to do 50 push-ups with no air in their lungs. The problem with the push-ups is that the exercise doesn't really warm the body. Therefore, I encouraged everyone to move around by jogging in place. In time, everyone had completely adjusted to the cold. At that point, the cold was no longer a problem. Instead, we were having a fun time doing all the different types of playful movements. I told them that this is the type of feeling I get when I expose myself to extreme colds. If the body is trained, anyone is capable of playing in the cold for an extended period of time. Remember, practicing gradual exposure can lengthen the amount of time that you can stay in the cold. After the movement session in the windy pasture, we took a break. I took the time to explain this story to them. Last week, I was on a television show where blindfolded psychics had to guess who I was. I was located in the Rotterdam Container Terminal. It was a chilly evening, and the wind was strong. 
It was my job to judge which psychic did the best. When they all finished their presumptions, I would score them and present it to the cameras. After an hour of them walking around me and trying to figure out who I was, I was asked to go inside of a temperature controlled container of negative 28 degrees Celsius, negative 18.4 degrees Fahrenheit. I had to stay in there for 10 minutes wearing only shorts. It was the psychic's goal to find me. The tricky part was that there were thousands of containers in the terminal. They needed to use their senses to locate exactly where I was. I prepared myself mentally before going into that container. I knew that it would be extremely cold, so I prepared my body for that. Soon after entering, my body began to shield the cold away from my core. I had lit the fire within myself. Next to my container was a heated car. Every 10 minutes, they were supposed to open the container and let me go in and warm up. However, I didn't need to leave the container. I was completely comfortable. I stayed in the container for a full hour. After the hour, I stepped out of the container and felt a warm breeze brush against my skin. You may ask, why did the cold wind feel so warm against your skin, Wim? Well, when I was in the cold, my body adapted to the temperature of the chilled container. It became more alert and willing to change with the environment. When I got out, the air felt warmer because my skin temperature had adjusted to the temperature on the inside of the container. The workshop participants nodded with excitement. Soon after, we all left to travel to the beach of the North Sea, where we would go for a cold swim. The wind on the beach was frigid and the water itself was 2 degrees Celsius, 35.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In their minds, they knew what they had to do, but their body was telling them a different story. Despite the strong avoidance responses that their bodies were giving them, they seemed determined to jump in and get it over with. We all went into the water together. After the initial shock was over, they all seemed very calm. We began splashing waves at each other and swimming around comfortably. With the right direction and enough energy, anyone is capable of doing this. After a few minutes, we all left the water and returned to the beach to get dressed in our clothing. But before anyone could begin changing, I shouted, that exercise was just the beginning. Before anyone could figure out what I was talking about, I took off running. Although they were dazed at first, within seconds they had begun to chase after me. Each was running in their bathing suit, barefooted through the cold sand. With each step, the sand sucked the heat away from their feet. After five minutes of running, I saw five people become red with an explosion of warm blood flowing through them. This was my goal. I wanted their bodies to readapt to the new cold environment. For those five people, it was a success. With this type of adaptation, you can last much longer in the cold. It's a natural reaction. We're all capable of it. My methods may have been unorthodox, but these people were able to see what their bodies were capable of. Each one had experienced the power of the cold. Hey, Jap, if you're out there, thanks for the opportunity to teach these wonderful people. I'd also like to thank the participants there from the bottom of my heart for their patience and endurance during my instructions. Thank you for looking past your limits. Chapter 32, The Endotoxin Experiment, A Great Fight by Wim Hof. Four years after the beginning of the Iceman research, I finally stumbled upon an opportunity to prove my point that we can influence the immune system and fight diseases by the power of our mind. While I was immersed in the ice bath at Radabout, Professor Nati was one of the people watching me with excitement. Professor Nati is well known for his research as an immunologist. He's a celebrated scientist and a well-known member of academia. I have met many world record holders in sports and other numerous disciplines. The ones with strong spirits do not boast. The same goes for Professor Nati. He remains humble despite his numerous achievements. His most recent research on the immune system using the endotoxin experiment is astounding. It focuses on what happens when the inflammatory marks in the body, which are the cause of numerous diseases, flare up too much and cause disease to human tissue. Being that I'm a trained person who shows unusual results when exposed to extreme temperatures, he thought it would be an interesting opportunity to see how my body differs from everyone else that he had tested. I accepted his invitation over the phone and agreed to take part in his research. He had gained approval to perform the endotoxin experiment despite my age. I was convinced that we could consciously influence the immune system, and Professor Nati would be the way to show the world that it was possible. Even though the experiment would get universal coverage and would probably be all over the newspapers and televisions, I was only focused on proving that anyone was capable of directly influencing the autonomic nervous system. We set an appointment to do the first checkup and collect basic data. The data showed that I was a perfectly healthy, older man in great physical condition. My heart rate at the time of the test was 39 beats per minute. Normally, an overactive immune system causes damage to human tissue. This experiment would see if I could suppress that overactive response. And if possible, we could potentially develop a method that would enable millions of people to improve their own immune systems. Inflammatory marked bodies can create inflammation, which is the cause of almost any disease. Therefore, being able to influence the immune system by meditation and specific breathing could be a natural weapon that mankind uses against disease. The morning of the endotoxin experiment, I woke up at 4 a.m. and performed my routine breathing exercises. 
I was in full spirits and ready to give my all at a hospital in Nijmegen. I was excited to show my stuff to the doctors, professors, medical team, and TV crew who would be there to watch me. I was anxious and nervous, yet I was fully aware of the challenge that I had to overcome. Suppressing a disease by sheer will without any external means would be nothing short of a gigantic breakthrough. A few hours later, I was lying in a hospital bed surrounded by scientists, the medical crew, and a television crew in a 7 by 5 meter, 23 by 16 feet room. The doctors wired me to numerous machines to record data. There, I would have to fight against an injected toxin. Not only would I have to fight against the disease, but also against the pressure of the people around me. Their expectations were high, and I wanted to fulfill them. Even though I didn't know what impact the injected poison would have on me, I had prepared my body the best I could. I began my breathing technique to give myself a head start. With each breath, I imagined that I was charging my immune system with more power. Right before I was injected, the doctors explained that I would feel the effects of the endotoxin soon after the injection. So, I prepared my body and received the poison as it was released into my blood. During the first few minutes, I felt nothing. There was no change. I told the doctors this, and they explained that most of the inflammatory marks would be present in my body 90 minutes after injection. 60 minutes passed, and I was fine. 75 minutes passed, I was still okay. I was waiting for any noticeable change in my body so that I could counter it. And finally, at about 90 minutes after injection, I felt a little headache begin to come on. I'd finally found my opponent. But it was far less than what I was expecting. Soon after focusing on the hostile force, the headache was gone and the pressure was relieved. What happened? I was expecting a war, and all I got was a little headache. Regardless, my immune system was ready and alert. When I found the headache, I had simply stimulated the immune system to work more efficiently. In this case, it meant suppressing the inflammatory bodies with sheer willpower. In a matter of minutes, it had gone. After about 40 withdrawals of blood and 10 hours of being wired in a hospital bed, it all came to an end. The professor and doctors were delighted with the results. They were amazed that I hadn't experienced anything more than a headache. My feeling was that of victory. and I cried several times that day. A long time of waiting to see if my beliefs were true had finally come to a victorious end. I felt relieved, as if a giant weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. It was my greatest adventure in bed ever. After the experiment, an enormous appetite had developed and my desire for food was intense. After eating, I went to a nearby hostel and slept. The following day, I returned to Bradbout for another checkup. Everything was fine. My body was in great condition. I drove home with my friend, Ben, who was there for me on this adventure. We sang songs with our hearts full of joy. And yes, it is possible to influence the immune system and fight disease. We will show everyone. Chapter 33, The Wind Tunnel Experiment by Wim Hof. One day, Maximum TV called me and asked if I was still interested in doing television performances. And since it was the way that I made money, I told them, yes. They were happy to hear my response. That's when they started talking about what they wanted to do, the wind tunnel experiment. They had two ideas that they wanted to pursue in this experiment. One of them was to strap me to the outside of a truck driving 80 kilometers per hour, 49.7 miles per hour, in temperatures near freezing. The other idea was to travel to Vienna, where there is a wind tunnel capable of creating winds that are 120 kilometers per hour, 74.5 miles per hour, with the temperature of 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I had never done anything like that before, so I was interested in both of the ideas. I was ready to test my body and mind once again. A couple of weeks later, I flew to Frankfurt, then Munich. There, I met the 27-year-old Dennis. Typically a journalist and a soccer player, Dennis was now going to host the show and join me in the experiment. He was eager to do a good job and give his best. The following morning, 10 of us began our 160-kilometer, 99.4-mile drive from Munich to Memmecken, Germany. Once we arrived, we stopped at a truck company that specialized in airline transport vehicles. One of their vehicles and an ambulance accompanied us to the nearby airport. When we arrived at the airport, the television crew began to set up. The medics checked on us to make sure we were in good condition. They checked our core temperatures, blood pressure, and heart rate. They declared us healthy individuals. The producer's goal was to now strap Dennis and I onto the back of a truck and then drive 80 kilometers per hour, 49.7 miles per hour, in the rain at 4 degrees Celsius, 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit. After the final preparations were made, the truck began to move. At 80 kilometers per hour, 49.7 miles per hour, the rain felt like hail as it hit our skin. I was barely clothed while Dennis had the advantage of wearing a raincoat. The combination of rain, cold temperature, and high winds took the heat from my body at a rapid pace. However, it made for a wonderful endurance test. Despite the hail-like rain, we quickly discovered that the extreme stunt was possible to do while remaining somewhat comfortable. 
Even for an untrained person like Dennis, he was able to maintain his composure and stay energetic. He suggested that maybe it was my presence and advice that gave him the ability to endure the cold. Either way, during those hours, we chilled out and had a great time. After many hours of driving, the television crew was finally finished. We packed up our stuff and started driving to Vienna. We stopped 150 kilometers, 93.2 miles short of Vienna. It was late, so we found a quaint hotel to stay in where we quickly fell to sleep. The next morning, we rose at 5 a.m. and quickly got back on the road. Soon after, we arrived at the Thermotest facility. It was a huge compound that had the ability to simulate a wind tunnel. When we first entered the building, we noticed an enormous refrigerator. There were pipes 10 meters in diameter covered in insulation feeding the wind tunnel. Using a propeller that is 7 meters high to generate the wind, this facility holds the largest wind tunnel in the world. When the emergency team arrived, which included a doctor and his assistant, we were ready to record. People were running all over the place to try to make all of the necessary preparations. I prepared myself mentally for the test. Eventually, we made our way to the front of the wind tunnel. Normally, the test trains resistance against temperatures from negative 40 degrees Celsius, it's also negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, to 60 degrees Celsius, which is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They were also able to simulate rain and snow during these tests to mock the outside environment. They told us that we would be doing the shot with the wind tunnel running at 100 kilometers per hour, 62 miles per hour, at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Dennis and I got our final checkups from the medics. My heart rate was at 68 beats per minute, while Dennis was at 122 beats per minute. Being that I'm more experienced when it comes to these situations, my heart rate stays relatively low while I'm preparing for the event. Soon enough, the camera's ready and it was time for the shot. A few moments later, Dennis and I were standing in front of the tunnel and the massive propeller began to spin. The tunnel was 12 meters high, 120 meters long, and controlled by a computer to create any possible weather condition. It was a beautiful sight. Dennis was wearing a jacket, but not me. He was standing a meter behind me. Of course, we were both a little anxious about what was to come because neither of us had experienced anything like it before. We didn't know what to expect. The sound from the propeller became louder. <laughs> The wind strengthened and we had to position our feet in a way to prevent us from being knocked over. At 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and 100 kilometers per hour, 62 mile per hour winds, it felt like a storm. It wasn't comfortable, but we were able to hold our ground, despite the wind stinging our face and sucking the heat from our hands. After 10 minutes into the storm, Dennis had endured all that he could handle. He raised his hand to signal to the crew that he was done. I was running in place and I had become extremely comfortable prior to turning off the propeller, but the first attempt was over and it was time to relax. We went back into a heated room to drink some tea and warm up. After an hour had passed, we were ready to go again. This time, they would turn up the wind speed to 120 kilometers per hour, 74 miles per hour, lower the temperature even more, and add rain into the equation. In the meantime, more shots were taken of our preparations. The television crew worked constantly to acquire as much footage as possible. Time was money, and they had little time to get the right shots. Back at the tunnel, Dennis was now wearing two raincoats and waterproof pants and I was wearing clothes that could easily soak the rain and keep it pressed against my body. We were ready. The cameras began to roll and we positioned ourselves in the middle of the tunnel. The powerful roar of the propeller came on and drowned out all other sounds. The rainfall came on pretty quick, and by the time the wind speed reached 120 kilometers per hour, 74 miles per hour, I was soaked. I also quickly became aware that it is incredibly difficult to remain balanced in 120 kilometer per hour winds, but I managed to do it somehow. However, now that the wind speed was much faster, the rain felt like hailstones. I was constantly being hit in the face with these rock-like water droplets. Dennis was still having a lot of difficulty with the pain as well. He couldn't stand it. After four minutes, Dennis gestured that he was done. When they turned the propeller off, he explained to the crew why he had stopped. Then he returned to the heated room to warm himself back up. My turn. They turned the propeller back on and the rain began to fall once again. I was able to easily hold my ground from the practice that I had in the last attempt. I was in the zone. I began to tap my heel and sing while the winds approached 120 kilometers per hour, 74 miles per hour. Harder and harder, the winds picked up speed. I continued to go deeper into my song and myself to try to bring out my spirit. After going deeper, I began to sense a presence. I felt like I was not myself. It felt like there is an Indian spirit inside of me. I was singing chants and I felt connected to the wind. I could identify with it. The cold of the winds didn't bother me anymore. I was in a trance and in total control. I felt like I was facing a great force, but felt no fear or danger. I was facing it with total tranquility. I had never experienced anything like this feeling before. It was incredibly intense. I felt like I was on top of the world. Even my experience on Mount Everest couldn't compare. The camera team was mesmerized, but their cameras continued to roll. 
The doctor was telling the crew to break off the experiment, but they were all too intrigued by the peace that I was showing. I felt so much in balance that I raised one foot off the ground and was now fighting against 120 kilometer, 74 mile an hour winds, standing only on one foot like a flamingo. Soon after, someone heard the cry of the doctor and signaled to turn off the experiment. They didn't understand that I was perfectly fine, but they broke it off anyway. I felt nothing but greatness. I'd seen the identity of the wind, and the spectators told me that watching the experience had emotionally touched them. Deep down, we all have a part of us that has the ability to connect with the elements of nature. We have the potential to connect with it fully and have our bodies adapt. Indians, who were close to nature, understood this very well and had the wisdom of the land. In civilization, we've lost that ability. Nature has the ability to make us whole, to fulfill us. Therefore, we must strive to become holy. Chapter 36, The Spanish Pyrenees by Wim Hof. Our drive from the Netherlands took us through Belgium, France, and finally Spain. Justin slept a lot because he was still very jet-lagged from the traveling, but in that time, Dennis and I conversed in Dutch and got to know each other on a deeper level. He expressed that he came on the trip because he wanted to learn more about the Iceman from the intellectual side. When we passed through the south of France, the atmosphere changed. The architecture of the buildings looked older and much more unique. Eventually, we crossed the France border and entered the Baisla Tunnel, leading us into Spain. As we drove through the Sierra de Guara, which is a desert-like area just south of the Spanish Pyrenees, I had a strange feeling. It had been 10 years since I was last in the Spanish Pyrenees. I felt like I was finally coming home. We arrived at 2 in the morning and found Anum sleeping in a hammock at the campsite. He had arrived a day earlier and set up the tent so that we could crash as soon as we got there. It was a long day of driving, so we left the introductions for the following day. Sunshine greeted us in the morning. It was a typical day in the Spanish Pyrenees. When I opened my eyes, I noticed a Bacata Bigunuaris tree to my side. They are well known for providing a lot of shade as well as large beans. We met for coffee at the restaurant located on site and discussed our plans for the day. Eventually, we all decided to start with canyoning and end with pointing. Canyoning is a great way to become one with nature. It's a very playful and an exciting experience. Water channels that eroded away at the space between the mountains produced the canyons and the Pyrenees. We now use ropes and other safety equipment to rappel down it. We left our car on site, and we all drove together in Anum's van. Anum is a 28-year-old who loves spending his time canyoning. He's a tall guy with a very contagious smile. He loves the outdoors and is a very enthusiastic gentleman. His most recent goal has been to set up a canyoning business. He wants me to join him because I have a lot of experience. I worked for nine years as a guide through the Spanish Pyrenees. Spain is like my second home. Anum drives like a racer. We had to hold our bodies against the force of every turn he made. We drove through the desert-like region until we had reached our first canyon, the Barranco del Rio. The Barranco del Rio is what we call a water canyon. This means that inside the canyon, there are many holes and paths filled with water. We had a lot of fun enjoying our stay in Sierra de Guara. After a quick picnic and a good bath, we threw our rucksacks back on, wrapped our ropes, and began hiking our way back up the mountain to where we had parked the van. The heat of the Spanish summer soon had us sweating, but the panorama was beautiful and the lake was enthralling. After hiking through the densely covered mountains with many trees and bushes, we finally found our way back to the parked van where we had started hours before. We placed our equipment in the back of the van and continued to our next activity, quinting. The drive was bumpy again as Anum kept his foot on the pedal. After several minutes, we had arrived at our quinting bridge. The bridge was raised at about 60 meters, 200 feet over the water. I knew what to expect because I had quinted hundreds of times before with many other people, but the last time that I did it was just over 10 years ago. I fell silent with excitement. Quinting is an activity where one person has one end of two ropes tied to their harness, while the other end is tied to the bridge. Before putting the ropes on the individual, they are pulled underneath the bridge and tied to the opposite side of the railing. Then, the person fastens the rope to their harness using carabiners and jumps off. The ropes that are tied to the other end of the bridge cause the person to fall straight down until the rope catches them, and at that point, the person swings back and forth from side to side until they lose the momentum. You could think of it as like a gigantic swing. During those first few seconds of freefall, it is very common to feel like there is an imminent danger of falling to your death. The tension of the abyss is enormous and sometimes will prevent people from taking the plunge. However, with little encouragement, most are willing to try. I decided to go first to make sure that the ropes were connected properly. Not knowing is always a scary feeling, but I had experience and was ready to complete my first jump in 10 years. I took a few careful breaths and began concentrating. One of the most important things to remember when quinting is that you must jump straight off the bridge. Any other angle can prove dangerous because you will enter the possibility of swinging into the bridge. I jumped. The first few seconds of freefall are the best part of quinting. 
I continually picked up speed until the ropes caught me and swung me to the other side. Knowing that you are capable of overcoming hesitation can be a powerful tool. It's an amazing feeling that gives you the boost of adrenaline and a rush of endorphins. After my ride ended, I connected myself to another wire that they had thrown down. I then lowered myself into the water below. After 20 minutes of preparation, it was Dennis's turn. Dennis is a powerful, analytic thinker. He knows the mind well. All he needed to jump off the bridge was a decision that he was going to be stronger than the fear, which he was. After saying mental power, Dennis jumped backward into the abyss. After another 20 minutes, it was Justin's turn to jump. Regardless of seeming nervous and tense, he jumped backward off the bridge without any hesitation whatsoever. Although, after a few minutes of swinging back and forth, Justin's motion sickness had kicked in and he began to throw up. He was successful, but a slave to his genetic disposition. After Justin had detached himself and swam to shore, it was Anum's turn. But no one knew he was going. He jumped off the side of the bridge while no one was looking. The experience of adventure is what Anum lives for. After Anum disconnected himself and returned to the top of the bridge, we disconnected the ropes and returned to our van. We all felt different. Accomplished. On the way home, we stopped by a river where there was a bridge 9 meters, 29.5 feet high. Justin still felt a little sick, so he stayed in the car while the rest of us went to leap off the bridge. From the bridge, Anum backflipped, I dove, and Dennis jumped. When we returned to the campsite, we made pasta with a nice mixture of vegetables and wine. Anum and I played guitar together and sang a beautiful tune. The next day, we traveled to a canyon 50 kilometers, 31 miles away, called La Pinilla. The canyon was known for its large repelling walls made of limestone. Wild horses and other fauna surrounded us as we made our way to the top of the canyon. When we had reached the top, we put on our harnesses, prepared our ropes, and got our cameras ready. It'd be a few hours before we reached the bottom of the canyon, so we also had to mentally prepare ourselves. We groped, jumped, and balanced our way to the bottom of the first repelling wall. Repelling is a calming movement down the rocky walls in nature. You have to surrender yourself to the materials protecting you. It can be scary at times, but you have to overcome that fear. Once you begin, there's no turning back. The only option is down. When repelling, people tend to hold on to the rocks and stay as close as possible to the wall. This is the complete opposite of what is necessary. It's important to make sure that there is never any slack in the rope. To do this, you must lean back at all times and stay focused on having your feet flat on the surface. Yes, it may be scary because it's an unnatural position to be in, but it's a necessity to repel safely. Once accustomed to the material and the way of using it, it's easy to go down very quickly. At the point when the inhibitions vanish, you are able to enjoy the scenery and view the great panoramas. It's a hands-on way to enjoy nature. Sometimes, people expect happiness to just enter their lives and change them from the outside, but it doesn't work like that. Those people need to work things out inside themselves. Happiness must spread from the inside out. I know this because I did a lot of problem solving to answer my own riddles. It took me a lot of time and confidence before I could view the world in color, rather than only black and white. For a while, I was emotionally disturbed. I looked for all kinds of challenges to take my mind off worrying. Eventually, I found out that nature was the answer for me that I was looking for all along. The answer varies from person to person, but that is because each person has his or her own path. We need to contemplate and look inside ourselves. Contemplation is the last stage before clarity. Try to open your mind and experience the world for what it is, not what you want it to be. When we finally got to the bottom of La Pania, we went swimming in a beautiful sapphire blue river. Anum left to go pick up the van while Justin, Dennis, and myself got to swim around. It was very relaxing after a long day of repelling. When Anum had returned, we went back to the campsite and made dinner. Guitar music and laughter filled the air until we grew tired and fell asleep. The next morning, we woke at 5 a.m. We had planned to go climb and repel a gigantic canyon, El Moscun. Anum was not able to come on the trip because he made plans elsewhere, but Justin and Dennis were ready for anything. We drove through the early morning and crossed the Ardeguara. After three hours of curvy roads, we had finally reached the little village of Rodear, which is at the border of the natural reserve for the Sierra de Guara. El Mascun is the Arabic name of the place that represents where spirits reside. For that reason, people in ancient times would avoid the canyon because of the sinister atmosphere. In reality, El Mascun is a living museum with gigantic monoliths everywhere. There are fossilized rocks at the top of the canyon at 1,100 meters, 3,608 feet. The mountain is the result of tectonic plates moving throughout the thousands of years. We got out of the car and took our backpacks up the winding path of the mountain. Soon, we began to see the mountain for the beautiful place that it was. Cars are not allowed near the mountain, so anyone who wants to repel it needs to hike a trail for many hours before they can begin to descend. When we reached the top, iron nails attached to ropes greeted us. The view was magnificent. 
pine trees surrounded the mountain on all sides. After gearing up, we tied into the ropes and began abseiling. Again, the feeling of overcoming inhibitions washed over me. Where most would feel imminent danger, I felt peace. We all did. Each cliff was a new challenge, one that we always were anxious to overcome. El Mascoon didn't let us down. It was full of exhilarating twists and turns, and we were never bored. We'd arrived early in the morning and didn't return until late evening. It had been a beautiful day, and we slept with the weight of success on our shoulders. Then came Monte Perdido. Located in Ordesa National Park, Monte Perdido reigns at 3,355 meters, 11,007 feet. It was the largest mountain we had set our sights on. Anum was still gone and wouldn't be able to join us for our set. What the Monte Perdido lacks in upsailing, it makes up for in terrain. The night before our final expedition, we rested our bodies on a campground a few miles away from Ordesa. After a hearty dinner, we talked about what we had accomplished thus far and what we hoped to gain on Monte Perdido. When the sun slept, so did we. The next morning, we packed up our sleeping bag and drove to a bus station. On the bus ride to Ordesa, we weaved through many narrow turns. For most of the ride, we teetered on the edge of a large crater, similar to America's Grand Canyon. The bus took us to Ordesa at 1,300 meters, 4,265 feet. We grabbed a cup of coffee from the local coffee shop and started the hour hike to the beginning of the Monte Perdido path. Forests full of pine and Vegas sylvitica trees surrounded us. The luscious combination provided beautiful scenery for the hike. Once we arrived at Monte Perdido's trail, the incline became steeper. After an hour and a half of climbing, we made our way past the point at which trees stop growing and the alpine vegetation begins. After a couple more hours, we finally arrived at Cavlajas de Corturo. This is the point in the mountain where there is no trail. The only way to continue on the path is to climb up metal nails that are cemented into the wall. Justin, Dennis, and myself had our backpacks and sleeping bags weighing us down. We had brought no climbing equipment with us, but we didn't need it. Our mission was about overcoming inhibitions. If anyone is unfamiliar with this type of climbing, vertigo may be one of the problems that he or she may have to overcome. This was the case for Justin. Despite his fear of heights, he forced himself to continue on with steady hands and careful steps. Even though he may have had a bit of hesitation, he was able to still climb Clavijas de Corturo with ease. In these moments, time seems to stand still. Nothing else matters except for that next step. If your focus is on anything else, you'll fall. These moments can teach us to remain in the present. Dennis was the last to cross the Clavijas de Corturo. He made it swiftly and safely across. A great feeling of accomplishment was present in all of us. We took several minutes to rest and meditate on a rock, hundreds of meters above the ground. After our little break, we continued on our path. When we reached the upper part of the walls facing Ordesa, we pulled ourselves over the cliff. Our eyes were blessed with beauty. Thousands of beautiful blue and purple flowers known as Iris Jevigidas were laid out across the land. There was also a miniature waterfall that opened into a stream, feeding water down the center and over the cliff. It was a surreal atmosphere. To me, this view alone is more beautiful than Mount Everest. It is always the same thing on Everest. Rocks, snow, and ice. Nothing grows at that altitude. All life is gone. But on Monte Perdido, the climate changes the higher you climb. Therefore, you pass all kinds of vegetation during the ascent, providing the eyes with new surprises every step of the way. At 2 p.m., we reached a refuge at 2,160 meters, 7,086 feet. We rested for half an hour, raised our expectations, and then set sail for the summit. Normally, a climb to the summit of Monte Perdido should be done on a separate day after resting at the refuge, but we were determined to continue on. As the path became steeper and more difficult, the air became colder. Justin and I were wearing only shorts and sandals. Dennis was wearing a black t-shirt, pants, and his hiking boots. We had left our sleeping bags and backpacks at the refuge. The people that we passed were astounded when they saw us attempting to summit the snow-covered slopes of Monte Perdido while only wearing limited clothing. At 3,000 meters, 9,842 feet, we were still going strong. The air was thinning out and the path was becoming steeper. Our minds were being tested to overcome fear and fatigue. We made our way over the snow-covered rocks, climbing along at a slow pace to preserve our energy. After a while, Dennis stopped and decided to turn around. He had done exceptionally well, but in his mind he had already decided to turn back. We told our friend goodbye and continued onward toward the summit. Adorned with great views, we felt like eagles, free from the worries of the world. 
Our majestic panorama was the result of much physical and mental endurance. It was the fruit of hard labor and constant meditation. Near the final stretch, Justin and I decided to take a break and sat down on two large rocks. Wim, Justin said, I was waiting for the right time to tell you about something that has been on my mind for a while. I think now is the perfect time. My ears listened attentively to Justin's every word. Curiosity consumed me. I was thinking about writing a book entitled Becoming the Iceman. I've been keeping track of all the stuff that we've been doing over the past year, and I think it would make for an incredible book. Ideally, it wouldn't include only the things that I've learned, but your experiences as well. In it, he continued, I think it'd be great to have stories leading up to what made you the Iceman. If we combine both of our experiences and include the challenges we had to overcome to become Iceman, it may have the potential to inspire others. We could give people the opportunity to become Icemen and ice women, especially if the book contained the method and technique. My mind was eager and my body language began to show it. Yes, this is what I wanted as a book. I didn't just want a book comprised of methods and techniques. I wanted a book full of experiences that would inspire people to become better and give them the knowledge they needed to succeed. This book needs to happen, I thought. One more thing, Justin said. I think it would be important to show that it's possible for anyone to do what you have done, to show that we all have the potential inside of us, a skill that just needs to be trained. I think a way we could show this is by you and I breaking a world record together. It could make our words more credible. What do you think? Yes, I told him, we need to break a world record together. It will be like I passing the torch on to you. It will be a lovely way to end the book. This time, I'll come to you. Let's do it in America. It was a marvelous idea and a great concept. Out of excitement and appreciation, we embraced each other. We never finished the climb to the summit, but we came back down in higher spirits than the summit could have ever given us. The idea was reward enough. There was no need to continue on. With a great feeling of success, Justin and I continued our way back down to the refuge. Our stomachs were tightly clenched, telling us to eat immediately. We ate very little that day and climbed more than 3,000 meters, 9,842 feet in height. There were climbers from many different backgrounds of the refuge. At dinner, many languages were spoken around the table. French, Dutch, English, Spanish, German, and even Basque. It's really great to know multiple languages. It helps me communicate and empathize with the random people that I meet on a daily basis. Finishing with wine and food was the perfect way to end our day. There was a lovely sunset outside. Instead of purchasing a room to sleep in that night, we decided to save the little money that we had to purchase breakfast in the morning. That night, we slept in our sleeping bags on a grassy hill outside of the refuge. I counted many stars in the vast night sky as I lay there trying to fall asleep. My mind was too excited to rest. Eventually, my thoughts died down, and then quiet, clear sky helped me doze off into a deep slumber. The next day, we continued down the mountain. Justin was a little more timid because his legs were sore and we had very dangerous slopes to climb down without gear. But because he trusted me, we made it down safely. He got rid of his inhibitions and descended successfully. During our long drive back, Justin and I discussed the possible records we could attempt together. Well, instead of the barefoot snow run that we were trying to organize in the US, he said, why don't we try breaking a record together first? Perhaps we could try sitting with our bodies fully exposed in the ice like you've done in the past. I shook my head. No, that takes a lot of training and is extremely dangerous, even for myself. No, I know what we should do. We should try to set the fastest time for a 5 and 10 kilometer run barefoot through the snow. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. However, I'll admit I have very little training running barefoot through the snow. I could tell from his voice that he was worried. Do not worry, I assured him. It will be very easy to learn. Very few people try. If you are determined to do it, you will adapt very quickly. I believe in you. We have to do it for the book. All right, Wim, Justin replied. I trust you. Barefoot running in the snow will be our record attempts. The experiences that Dennis, Justin, Anum, and myself had will never be forgotten. They are deeply rooted in our minds and brought us closer, like a family. Even though our memories of the Spanish Pyrenees will last forever, we now had bigger plans in the making. Chapter 38, Lectures from the Iceman by Wim Hof. In November of 2010, an international conference was held in Florida where Professor Hoffman presented her results for my autonomic nervous system test. She presented the results of my experiment from when I stood in a Perspex box full of ice cubes for 1.5 hours. I had a presentation of my own that I prepared for 300 doctors, assistants, and physicians in Europe. I have included that lecture for you here in this chapter to give you an idea of what it's like to attend one of my lectures. Good evening. 
Let me start off by saying that I'm honored to be here and I have a lot of respect for everything that you do. I usually don't have a lesson plan for my lecture, so I'd like to start off by showing you a few video clips of me swimming under the ice, climbing snowy mountains in shorts, running a marathon beyond the polar circle, and finally, the research explaining how my body works. Hopefully, these video clips will give you an idea of what my body and mind have been exposed to. I then proceeded to show them some of my videos that have been displayed on YouTube. After the video clips finished, I continue on with the presentation. So what can we learn from this? Well, I believe that if we can go deep enough into our minds to influence the autonomic nervous system, as well as the immune system, we can prevent diseases from harming our body. How is this possible? You might ask. The cardiovascular system is made up of muscles that we can train. By exposing them to natural stimuli, such as the cold, we can make the muscles stronger. This is as easy as taking a five minute cold shower after a warm one. With cold exposure, the muscles in the arteries are trained. The opening and closing of the muscular walls are like lifting weights at the gym. With training, it builds up strength. With each cold shower, the body improves immensely. The onset of natural adaptation happens rather quickly. Once the muscles in the arteries are strong enough, you'll be able to go on to your next phase. In the next phase, a physiological aspect comes in. Here, you don't want to take a warm shower before turning on the cold. Try stepping directly into a cold shower. This takes a lot more determination. The aim of the exercise is to be able to close your veins by sheer will. A big part of being able to do this is by focusing on your breathing. Try not to gasp when you are first exposed to the cold water. When you can do this and feel in control, the veins around the vital parts of the body contract as well as the skin. This is all possible after gradual adaptation of phase one. It is an essential step to develop naturally without force. This phase helps your body consciously control the cardiovascular system. Through concentrated exercises, you will adapt fast. Your will is also tested through all of these exercises. You may think it would be much easier to simply turn off the shower and put on warm clothes, and this is in fact true, but you're not helping your body. In fact, you are doing the complete opposite. Listening to your intuition becomes a big part of this exercise. If you are willingly in the cold and accepting the exercise, your body will begin to give you signs that you're ready to move on to phase three, ice water immersions. With the exercise in phase one and phase two, you will have learned how to deal directly with the cold. You will then understand that it takes willpower and determination to get through the experience as well as hopefully knowing your body better. The physiological development in phase two opens up a new range of possibilities. At this point, you will know how to influence the cardiovascular system and you will have tapped into consciously communicating with the hypothalamus, our mental thermostat. Once you can control that, why not tap into another part of your brain? When you can consciously steer the hypothalamus, you can bring in visualization. We all daydream at times, but it's mostly done by our subconscious. I implore you to practice visualization by imagining how powerful you'll be when submerging yourself in ice water. Imagine yourself going in and feeling completely at ease. Know that there won't be a problem because your body will adapt. Now, visualize heat in your lower stomach. Imagine that with each breath, you are breathing in fire and it fills your body. It isn't hocus pocus, this actually works. Thinking that your body is getting warmer will actually make your body warmer. Just try it. I never had a teacher, I learned from my experiences. With a determined mind, I generated enough energy to deal with cold exposures. Eventually, I was able to build up my stamina by training in snow, ice, ice water, and cold winds. These breathing techniques helped me do that. Phase three is different from the previous two phases. It is still in cold water, but the experience is much different. Your mindset is crucial to develop absolute control of your body. The ice water immersions take determination and visualization. Controlled breaths are essential. When you first slide into ice water, take controlled conscious breaths. Do not gasp. Try to relax and let the body adapt naturally. Usually, this takes about 30 seconds before the body begins to feel at ease. And once you've relaxed, the mind will do its part and keep the body warm. Concentrate and visualize heat in your lower stomach. Breathe in and make the heat spread from your lower stomach to the outer parts of your body. When you breathe out, get rid of the cold. When you breathe in, use that breath to generate heat. Believe in yourself and trust whatever your body tells you. The experience is real and it has been proven using scientific methods. With these exercises, we can fight disease and begin to live a healthy life. Just go within yourself and tap into your inner nature. Soon after giving the lecture you've just read, I was asked to give another lecture in front of the doctors of Albert Schweitzer's hospital in Rotterdam. It was my next big challenge. Minnelli, the man who's doing a documentary on my life, came along as well. Together, we went with Ono, his cameraman. We drove in two cars to Rotterdam. 
It took us a long time because the congested traffic, which is a very typical occurrence in the Netherlands, considering that every day there is construction on at least one road. After a few hours in the car, we had finally arrived at the location, the SS Rotterdam. It's a huge cruise ship in the harbor of Rotterdam. The ship was very impressive, but I tried to remain focused on what I would say in my lecture. We grabbed our gear from the cars and went to the receptionist's desk. They sent us to the upper deck where we had a panoramic view over the harbor and the skyline of Rotterdam. Manelli and Ono got the cameras ready while I finished preparing the lecture in my head. The conference room took up the entire backside of the ship. 100 doctors sitting in comfortable chairs adjacent to little tables occupied the room. The stage where the lectures were given was nicely done. There was a painted background on the back end that had images of mountains and rocks. Manelli and Ono began rolling the cameras and the audience became quiet. An experienced speaker and a cardiologist introduced me. A microphone and a giant screen were my utensils to speak and visually show what I would normally do in my challenges. We showed three video clips. The first was my barefooted half marathon ice run in Lapland. The second was my world record attempt swimming under ice water. The third was the physiological experiment that took place at Radboud University Hospital. When the video clips ended, I began speaking. Here's what I said. I have no program, no concrete story in my head that I'm going to tell you, but it's just the way that I am. Your energy and attention will help me guide this lecture. However, I do have a message. I want to show that everybody is capable of influencing the immune system. I don't care about the sequence of my words as long as the message is well understood and can be passed on to you. The lecture continued that way for a while. Soon my inhibitions were gone and my words flowed out like a river with a strong current. While I lectured, images and video footage played behind me. Everyone was captivated and listened carefully. The audience remained silent and attentive. I told them about going deep into myself, about the challenges that present themselves in hard nature, about exerting more effort than we usually can contribute, and about nature as my teacher. I explained that nature is hard but righteous. I also told them about how I had learned to breathe differently, deeper and more effective. I explained that my breathing helps me perform better in nature and makes me more capable of taking on impossible tasks. It may sound weird, but going into the extreme cold in nature, especially when you're barely wearing clothes, introduces a different state of mind. It's almost intuitive. I continued, nature rules, nature learns, nature lectures. You have to go deep, deep inside yourself to where the nervous system, immune system, cardiovascular system, heart, and mind all work together. When all these systems are working together, it guarantees a tremendous power. I've learned to trust this wholeheartedly. The sensation of overcoming the worrisome mind and controlling it is unmistakable. To be able to feel united in body and mind and not alienated from nature is a powerful thing. I have no fear of climbing without gear. I have the ability to avoid falling rocks reflexively without consciously seeing them fall. I have the ability to tell a cramp in my leg to go away. I could run a full marathon in shorts beyond the polar circle without any prior training whatsoever. I have the capability to use mind over matter. Deep trust is about knowing that you are fully capable of functioning at your best within your body and mind. The cold teaches you through powerful lessons. For hundreds of years, we have worn clothes and developed better fabrics to maintain our heat. We have confided in the warmth of our homes and avoided the cold as much as physically possible. We have settled for living comfortably, never testing out our boundaries. To keep our bodies strong, we need to train ourselves in nature. The cold is a powerful voice with a wise lesson. With the right adaptation, we can bring back control over the internal workings of our body. It helps us be more alert and reactive to any negative disturbances in our body. Let us take the cardiovascular system for example. This can be conditioned to function better by doing gradual cold exposures. It is a system that has the ability to become stronger with training. Training the muscular walls of the arteries helps pump blood more efficiently throughout the body. I found that it even lowers 20 to 25 beats off of the resting heart rate. Overall, this aids in making your thoughts more peaceful and coherent. We are capable of building extraordinary structures, flying into space and programming computers, yet we continually avoid the opportunity to explore our bodies and push their limits. Keep this in mind, young doctors, that we are at the forefront of new discoveries within the human mind and body. My message is that everyone is capable of influencing the immune system and that the cold is a noble, natural force that can help teach us how to regain that ability. Our health is important. Why avoid this useful tool any longer? In medieval times, we thought the earth was flat and we wouldn't dare venture toward the horizon for fear of falling to our deaths. Imagine the fear that must have caused. 
to be eternally trapped. Yet, we changed our mindsets and discovered new worlds because we were driven to challenge our perceptions. Our perception shapes the way that we live. A lot of the time, it could prevent us from reaching our potential. The cold is a force that must be taken seriously, as we do with the heat. When you're sitting in front of a fireplace, you think it's comfortable and nice. You don't stick your hand in the flames. And the same is true for the cold. You don't just dive into ice water, stay there for hours and expect to live. You must gradually expose yourself. The best way to start is through cold showers. You don't need to be a professional football player to enjoy the health benefits of playing football. Just as well, you don't need to expose yourself to the extreme temperatures that I do to reach the immune system. All I'm suggesting is that we start fitting in a few cold showers into our weekly schedules. Feeling that my message was well understood, I thanked the audience for their time. Afterward, Minnelli and Ono packed their cameras, we ate some dinner, and began our long drive back to Holland. We'd done well. It felt like I had taken a giant step in the right direction. Chapter 39, The New Year by Wim Hof, December 2010. After a heavy period of snow here in Holland, deadly cold baths and running barefoot through the snow, I had one thing in mind, Hong Kong. Another opportunity had presented itself where I could travel to Hong Kong to attempt my world record again, encased in ice. The plane tickets were arranged for me to fly out over Russia, Siberia, most of China, and then eventually land on an island near a giant statue of Buddha. When I arrived, a 54-year-old Japanese man greeted me. His name was Sano. The temperature was warm compared to Holland. In Hong Kong, the temperature was 19 degrees Celsius, 66.2 degrees Fahrenheit, while in Holland, it was negative 10 degrees Celsius, 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Despite the warmer weather, a lot of people were heavily clothed. They seemed like they had a natural disposition to feeling cold and were in desperate need of staying warm. I was walking around in a t-shirt and felt completely comfortable. As Sano guided me through the river floating through the city, he pointed out huge buildings with mesmerizing architecture. He escorted me to the giant entrance of a five-star hotel. My room was relatively small, but the view was magnificent. I felt like a king. I saw many statues of Bruce Lee around the city. There were many photos that showed great respect for him as a martial artist. I feel that he died too young. His statues gave me inspiration to perform well in the beautiful city full of exotic palm trees and subtropical botany. Two days after my arrival, the city was blessed with the heat of a warm summer day. It was a heat that could touch the solemnness of the soul. It helped me take my mind off the upcoming challenge. Sano took me all kinds of places. He was a very nice man who was a pleasure to be around. He was also extremely busy because he was helping to organize the events surrounding the countdown to 2011. Sano arranged a press conference focusing on global warming awareness, and I was his protagonist promoting the message. I didn't know much about global warming, but I tried my best to represent the issue. There were 15 microphones, 30 journalists, and 10 video cameras while I did my lecture on global warming. Here's what I said. I have no knowledge in politics, nor am I someone against the love of the world. I think that the children are our future and that the coming generations who will inhabit this world need to be raised in a world that is balanced. We as humans can protect ourselves against the changing weather conditions, but animals and plant life cannot. In the end, we won't be able to turn our back on the world and avoid the consequences of our actions. Exploiting our ecosystem to receive financial gain is just not worth it. I'm here to break a world record in the ice and therefore take the opportunity to raise attention worldwide. I would like to help broaden the vision concerning this delicate matter of global warming. The nature outside of ourselves directly influences the nature within us. We've become strangers to nature over the years because we're no longer living directly in nature. We are always spending money on clothes and surrounding ourselves with technological luxuries. We've lost our touch with nature. We've become blind in a way. Therefore, I'm thankful for the opportunity to express my thoughts with you and show you what can be done when you are connected to nature. Then, it was time to immerse myself in a cold ice bath inside of a transparent container. Click, click, click. A photo shoot was happening outside of the container. My exposed body was being imprinted on the cameras of those around me. Two days after that, the record attempt was imminent. The plan was for me to begin the full body ice endurance record at precisely 10.20 p.m., when I would get out one hour and 50 minutes later, it would be 10 minutes into the new year, 2011. A little before the event, I sat down in the audience and tried to relax. The crowd was enthusiastic and many gave me admirable looks. After some dancers performed on stage, the announcer mentioned that the world record was about to begin. I walked up beside the announcer and he asked a few questions like, how are you feeling? Are you confident that you will be able to break the world record? My mind was only set on one thing, just do it. A few of the people lifted the Perspex box and I walked in. They set the box upright and began filling it with the ice. 
It usually takes between 5 to 10 minutes to fill it completely. The ice poured over my shoulders and I checked how my body was reacting to it. And this is what was happening inside of me. Full of determination, I charged myself up with adrenaline and dopamine. The adrenaline made me feel strong against the cold impact and the dopamine was my pain reliever. When I was completely covered in ice, the walls of my cardiovascular system contracted and began their search to find a way to work as efficiently as possible without releasing heat. The veins around my vital organs contracted and I steered the blood to circulate around them to keep warm. This keeps my core temperature stable. When all these conditions were met, the time to endure began. The better I was at keeping my core temperature stabilized, the longer I'd be able to stay in the ice. Sometimes I would begin to feel the cold in a certain part of my body, and by simply concentrating on that spot, I was able to transfer heat to that area to warm it back up. I have two important responsibilities when I am fully immersed in ice. I feel like they are the perfect example of mind over matter. The first is being able to keep the veins and arteries closed around the core. The second is redirecting heat toward parts of my body when they get cold. Both are done consciously. This reminds me of a 55-year-old man named Leonard who had once emailed me. He was interested in some of the articles that he had read about reaching the immune system. Leonard's body was completely paralyzed, except for his head. Despite Leonard's inability to move his body, he still suffered from chronic aches and pain. I visited Leonard and told him that there is power in man that can alleviate the pain. Simply direct energy to the aches and imagine them going away. It only took him 20 minutes to figure out how to do it, and ever since then, he's been able to relieve his pain using only his mind. The influence of the mind is powerful. When you are completely fed up with a situation, you are more willing to break through the conditioned mind. Leonard just needed a little push to get him going. Now, back to the story. So there I was, standing on a stage in front of thousands of people, all cheering me on. I was completely in control and winning the fight against the cold. Groups of performers danced beside me. Sometimes, the steps that they would take on the stage would shift the ice inside of the box, making it harder for me to stay warm. Every performance in the ice is a different one. I can't ever go in unprepared because if something unexpected happens, there's a huge chance that I will get hypothermia. I know a perfect example of this. The last time I attempted the record, I was in Tokyo. They had stuck a temperature probe in my mouth to monitor my body heat. It made it extremely difficult for me to breathe. My oxygen saturation felt dangerously low. And after an hour of this, I had enough. I made them take the probe out. Immediately, everything felt much better. By the time I'd reached the new record time, my oxygen saturation was back to 100%. I had another problem with this particular ice record when I did it in Austria. The temperature outside was freezing, and when I broke the world record and they tried to get me out, they failed. The air had completely frozen all of the ice cubes together, and I had become part of an ice sculpture. After they pulled the Perspex box off of me, they needed to chop away at the ice with axes. So, like those times, I had to deal with something unexpected. I needed to battle against the ice as it massaged my skin from the dancers. I was determined to break the world record, so I pressed on. One hour and 50 minutes after being immersed, I had finally set the new world record. Big cheers from the audience came as I was freed from my icy tomb. It was finally time for a nice, warm bath. I went back to my hotel room, jumped in the hot tub, and fell asleep. Hours must have passed by because when I woke up, Everyone who was partying in my hotel room was gone, and the wine that was given to me as a gift was empty. In its place, someone had left a basket of fruit. How kind. Regardless, I had succeeded once again. The following day, Sano took me to the Chinese Sea, and we spent the day walking along the water. When we got back to the city of Hong Kong, there was a surprise waiting for me. There was a Chinese wedding taking place, and they wanted me to be the guest of honor. It was a beautiful ceremony. But sadly, I wasn't able to attend the reception because my plane left at 11 p.m. We took the subway back to the airport where we had cheap but tasty sushi before we separated. Sano was really nice company and he made the experience feel like a movie. We embraced each other and said our final goodbyes. Chapter 40, Strength and Honor by Wim Hof. Minnelli, a talented film director and a good friend of mine, is making a documentary that relates to this book and helps illustrate the point that we can all reach and influence the immune system. This finding could have huge repercussions in the world and shift the perception of the general population. As I continually show people the health benefits of gradually training in the cold, I hope it leads to a total prevention of diseases. A few days ago, from the time of writing this chapter, I visited Minnelli and brought some DVDs of my former documentaries over to him. While he reviewed the DVDs, one particular clip caught my attention. The Superhumans and the Quest of the Fantastic Four is a series that claims that I'm a superhuman. This is the video footage that shows me running a half marathon barefoot in the snow. Specifically, this is the run that resulted in frostbite. 
I can't say that my decision to keep running was only based off of intuition. I had let my emotions get the best of me. I had a situation at home that had left me emotionally distraught. I wasn't thinking properly, and sadly, I let it affect my decision. I took the challenge offered by the Discovery Channel because it was a quick way to escape from the emotional stress at home. Normally, I don't make rash decisions like that because I know the limits of my body extremely well, but this time, I decided to press on despite the imminent damage and signals that my body was sending me. I was really determined to finish the race, but after pressing on, that's when the medic forced me to stop. She had told me that I was at risk of losing my toes. She also mentioned that it'd be foolish if I continued, but it was my decision. As you know, I ignored her. I desperately wanted to cross that finish line. So I pressed on, regardless of the potential consequences. I know it may sound ridiculous, but I think it was what I was supposed to do. It taught me something about myself that I would have never learned otherwise. No matter what anyone tells you, you can do anything. Nothing is impossible. The doctors told me that I had done irreversible damage to my foot and that I'd never be the same again. Well, they were wrong. I'm still doing my challenges. I'm still breaking world records. And I'm still telling you that I'm capable of doing anything because so are you. There is nothing superhuman about me. I'm just a man that loves fulfilling human potential. It can take strength and courage to heal oneself when facing a grim future. But we're all capable of confronting fears and pushing through them. Find that power inside of you and heal your dilemma. There was a time 20 years ago when I was suffering from a severe case of pneumonia. At the time, I was raising four children on my own, and my wife had just passed away. I was extremely emotional, and we didn't have much money. My body could take a lot, but when I became emotionally drained, I was susceptible to diseases. Somehow, I had developed pneumonia in the midst of the summer. After days of feeling a strange pressure in my chest, I had suddenly lost my energy and collapsed against a tree. At that moment, I decided to go see a doctor. He told me that I was suffering from a severe case of pneumonia and prescribed an antibiotic. He told me that I should be healed in about a month. I took one capsule and immediately felt better. Once I got that feeling, I just wanted to take over the healing process. So that one capsule was the last one that I ever took. I grabbed a hold of the wheel and visualized myself getting better. And before I knew it, the pneumonia had left as fast as it had come. I'm not suggesting that you ignore what your doctors or physicians tell you. What I am saying is that we all have an inner doctor that guides us as well. There's one last story that I would like to share with you about healing. A few years ago, I severely tore my large and small intestines. I could have died from this, but it wasn't my time. The ambulance transported me to the hospital and cut open my abdomen. They worked for hours trying to repair the damage. After making a temporary bypass, they patched me up and closed the wound. The doctors told me that my extreme sports career was over, that it would take me at least a year and a half to recover. That night, they escorted me to my room in the hospital and left me there. When the light was turned off, and my door was shut, I began to do a physical examination of my own. I had a gigantic scar on my abdomen where they had made the incision. I sat there for a while, just staring at the wall. Eventually, I made the decision to get out of bed and walk around. It was an enormous task. My body was in really bad shape, but I was extremely determined. Centimeter by centimeter, I moved myself from laying down to placing my feet over the side of the hospital bed. It felt like hours to get here. Finally, the soles of my feet touched the ground. I lifted myself off of the bed, and there I was, standing. I was standing. I checked myself out, observing my condition like a wounded animal. After a bit, I stopped caring about my wound and took interest in my surroundings. I gazed out the window and saw the stairs in the night sky. Even though I'd taken a lot of my effort to move even centimeters, I was able to achieve my goal. Getting out of bed was my first step in starting up my healing process again. I had won my first battle. Exhausted, I turned back to the bed and slowly laid myself down. Eventually, I fell into a deep sleep. Every day from that point on, I continued with the same determination. I couldn't eat for two weeks because my intestines didn't work, but I kept pushing. Finally, my intestines were able to process food. Another victory. Three months from the time of my injury, I was performing in the ice again. I was able to perform at ease and my body was in great shape. I didn't have to wait the year and a half that the doctors had suggested. My inner doctor had performed miracles. Doing something like that takes a lot of courage, strength, and responsibility. You have to trust that there is a lot to gain and that quick healing is possible. It is at that point where the inner doctor will greet you. Two months after that, I set a new world record for standing in a box where my body was completely immersed in ice. And two months after that, I climbed Kilimanjaro while only wearing shorts. That's when I returned to Lapland, the place that had given me irreparable damage. This time, I ran twice as far 
and completed a full marathon with no damage to my foot whatsoever. Despite my injuries and setbacks, I've still managed to press on and take on more challenges. The body adapts if you're willing to test it. My intestines healed six times faster than the time that the doctors told me that it would take. It is possible for you to do the same. Trusting that you are capable will make a lot of difference. But believing in yourself and knowing that it is possible will make all of the difference. Strength and honor isn't only achieved through sports and challenges. Fighting for life itself makes you a hero. A gladiator doesn't need a sword if his mind is as sharp as a razor blade. Cut through the desperation and dependence and focus on the everlasting possibilities. Chapter 42, New Adventures by Wim Hof. After many challenges, I feel like I've finally made it to the level of an extreme sportsman. I provide for my family and myself by living this way. It comes from dedication and conquering the mind. For a while, it seemed like it would never end. Honestly, I don't know if it ever will, but at least things are getting better. I have a piece in my mind that helps me understand life on a deeper level. I would like to pass on to you some lessons that I've learned along the way. My challenges aren't always amidst freezing temperatures trying to break a world record. A few of my other challenges are instructing people during my workshops, writing a book, doing my thing while in a scientific setting, and proving that we can do more than we think. One of my more recent goals has been to teach hundreds of children how to run barefoot over the snow. I'd like to instruct them how to bring about power to resist the cold. Once they see that it is possible, hopefully, they will become more prone to embrace the cold and the lesson it can teach. In a couple of months, I'll be climbing Kilimanjaro again. It will be documented by German television. The amazing thing about doing these challenges is that my way of living makes me a living. In other words, I get paid to do what I love doing. Their program will be about extraordinary people. I'm hoping that this program will help inspire others to confront the cold. Inspiration is a nice thing to give, and I'll do what I can to help others receive that. Despite however many people I try to teach, only those with open ears, heart, and dedication will be able to pursue it. Another upcoming challenge is my run through the Sahara Desert. I plan to go 50 kilometers without drinking any water. I'm convinced that it is possible even though all of the doctors tell me otherwise. I worked for eight years in the Spanish Pyrenees during the hot summers. Every day I carried my rucksack weighing 20 kilograms, 44 pounds on my back for the entire day without drinking any water. I did this because it felt good and my body told me that I was okay. I believe that at a certain moment when my sweating stops, an auto-circulative fluid system kicks in and begins to regulate my body temperature. At this point, I think my body stops sweating to conserve the fluids and keep the body functioning. When this process would happen to me in the Spanish Pyrenees, I would feel a sort of high off of natural drugs, comparable to the feeling that one would get when experiencing a runner's high. The same happens when I am exposed to the cold. When Justin and I decided to try breaking two world records together, we had no training. What I mean is, we didn't train specifically for that run. Justin hadn't run much in the snow because there wasn't any snow to run in. Personally, I hadn't done much running either. I had been focused on all the research and workshops that I couldn't find time to do any endurance workouts. The thing is, we had faith that it was possible. We knew that we would be prepared when the time came and we were willing to work hard to get there. Justin began using his experiments to simulate running in the snow while I began running slowly. With time, I increased my distance and speed as my body became more accustomed. For any challenge that comes up, we will find the tools to overcome it. The most challenging thing in life is the mind. Let opening your mind to new opportunities, just let that be your next goal. When you get there, teach others how to do it. It's a useful technique that all of mankind can benefit from. It's not some spiritual nonsense, it's just a technique to deal with worrisome thoughts. When you go deep enough, natural drugs like endorphins and adrenaline can help your body deal with usually intolerable situations. We can do more than we think, and there is still so much terrain to discover. In many people, the veins and arteries in their bodies are unconditioned. They aren't used to pumping blood efficiently because they're untrained. It causes numerous problems like heart attacks and arthritis. Diseases that deal with blood circulation cause many deaths each year. Millions suffer from bad circulation of the blood. This can all be prevented. You can easily train your cardiovascular system by taking cold showers. The walls of the vessels transporting blood contract and then dilate because of the cold impact. Start slowly and gradually increase your training as the time it takes for your ability to adapt decreases. It's like any other sort of training that you do for your cardiovascular system like running, swimming, etc. By training the cardiovascular system, the heart is able to pump blood to the vital parts of your body more efficiently. By taking stress off of your heart, it is quite possible to lower your resting heart rate. I would like to share with you a short story from my childhood. When I was seven years old, I was playing in a pasture near my house covered from the thick snow of winter. 
My friends and I built the best igloo a group of seven-year-olds could possibly build. It took us all day to build it, and by the end of the day, it was majestic. One by one, my friends went home to eat, to sleep, or because they were tired. I, however, stayed because I felt attached to the igloo. I felt like it was my home, my beautiful home. I continued adding snow to it over the next few hours. I molded the walls, built the chairs, and even a bed. I then went into the igloo because it was ready to be lived in. A warm feeling of accomplishment washed over me. I lay myself down on the bed and stretched out. I felt the coolness leak through my layered clothing. It felt nice. Despite a couple of holes in the ceiling, the igloo was perfect. A few rays of sunshine shone through, made the experience all the more beautiful. After watching the rays dance off the walls for a few minutes, I fell asleep. Hours passed before someone shook me. I felt something bringing me back from my slumber. They were tearing at my jacket. Wim, Wim, wake up. Wim, wake up. The sound felt like it was coming from far away. I couldn't consciously conceive what was going on. And finally, my eyes opened and I became aware of my older brother's presence. Get up. We have to go home. Mama and Papa are looking everywhere for you, he said. My feeling was that of a drunken man. Being that I was seven years old, I had no idea what was going on in my body. I had never experienced anything like that. I felt very heavy and my movements were slow. I had no control over my limbs. I couldn't even get up. Eventually, I realized that these are the symptoms of hypothermia. My brother helped me get home by supporting my weight, and when I arrived, my parents were relieved of their worries. They escorted me to bed where I lay shivering and drowsy. Eventually, I fell asleep, cold. Everyone was worried that day. I had almost slept forever in the cold, thinking it was my warm home. I call it the white death. It's where people can feel warm and comfortable in the cold, but when they fall asleep, they succumb to hypothermia. Eventually, they can slip into a coma and die. To me, it was a mysterious near-death experience. The cold has the power to change the mind. In my case, I was a victim of the cold, yet now I'm able to confront it head on. Although to someone unprepared, it is a dangerous force, but simultaneously, it has the power to dig into the deeper levels of the mind. At the age of 11, I had another dangerous cold encounter. In this encounter, I didn't feel a negative sting with the cold. Instead, it just felt like I was going to take a nice warm sleep. Here, here's what happened. While riding my bike on the way to school one day, that feeling came over me and told me to stop. I stepped off my bike and slept on someone's porch. I was tired and drowsy, but fell asleep cozily. But when I awoke, I was being carried into an ambulance. The doctors kept me in the hospital for one week for observation. They couldn't figure out how I could have survived. These mysterious experiences have strengthened my relationship with the cold. I now recognize it as a noble force that teaches me life lessons. Now, I'm able to control the impact that the cold has on my body and use it to help my body stay healthy. I've come a long way since I was seven. Chapter 43, The Final Chapter by Wim Hof. My mother was a good person, a saint, I would say. As a devout Catholic, she would consciously, and sometimes unconsciously, ask God to tackle any of the satanic powers related to sickness. During the delivery, while I was still in her womb, she prayed that it would come naturally to the light of God's creation, the world. Even though I'd nearly suffocated, I came into existence. And from then on, she promised God that I would become a missionary. I've tried to do my best to fulfill her promise. Thank you, God. And thank you, Mama. May she rest in peace. Up until two days before my 52nd birthday, I was unaware of how much this mission controlled my life. It had driven me, sometimes irrationally, through all of my challenges and it brought me near many close encounters with death. Yet somehow, I always found a way to succeed. I've sacrificed many things in my life. I've had highs and lows, but now I'm finally reaching a peace of mind. There is something within me that is finally settling. I feel like I have finally succeeded in my mission. Knowing that everyone in the world is able to influence his or her immune system makes me believe that I've finally won. It has been a long journey, but I'm finally coming home within myself. The mind can be like an animal at times. Now, I can stand erect like a proud Maasai because I've killed the lion inside of me. From the cold corridor where I was born in this final chapter, it has been a great journey. The cold is a warm friend who I hold dear. As it trains the cardiovascular system, it brings about a great light, faith, and power. I'm thankful toward God for making the light brighter than the shade. It made my path distinguishable. No longer will my heart be fooled by the tricks of the mind. My heart is full of love and compassion. I choose to serve mankind and to help bring everyone in sight through science. Let us dance on the waves of victory. Let us sing joyfully of the blissful presence. Without speculation, the light 
always wins. The light gives lucidity to the mind, emanates from the heart, and shows true faith. As I write this, only a week has passed since Justin and I were in Lapland. Together, we ran the 5 and 10 kilometer race against time through ice and snow. Becoming the Iceman is the start of something powerful. I am sure more books will follow. We are on a path to conquer the mind beyond any shred of doubt. We wish to bring the world justice, true knowledge, and the power within. I apologize if what I'm saying sounds pretentious, but there is no doubt in my mind that it is unjustified to exclaim everything that I've just said. It comes from the heart and from my unshakable faith. This knowledge is not mine to keep. I am merely a messenger that has been given an opportunity. Now, I am giving you that opportunity. Help our method find its way to the world. Bring the knowledge from within and share it. The knowledge is like a safe. Only those who know the combination can unlock it. Tell those who are willing to listen and give them the blessing of understanding. Just do it. Right on. Go for it. These, among other exclamations, I've shared with most of the people I've encountered. They are simple, like a child, but can bring people out of the world of speculation, the mist of ignorance, disbelief, and helplessness. Friends, brothers, sisters, love will unite us all and overcome our narrowing differences caused by the normal patterns of thought. Let me tell you this. There is nothing more beautiful than the simple peace of mind and conscious sharing of the good of existence. Chapter 44, Introduction to the Methods by Wim Hof. As you progress through the stages of the cold exercises, you will begin to understand the body on a deeper level. You will also realize that you can gain better control over your body's physiological response to the cold. In time, you'll begin to experience something that we, as Westerners, thought was impossible by consciously influencing the autonomic nervous system. Normally, people view the cold as a negative force, wearing multiple layers to protect their body. Those people that escape the exposure will never recognize the true potential of the cold. We have become alienated from nature, but the cold is capable of bringing us back to what we once lost. The cold is a marvelous medium, a noble force. Training and natural adaptation in the cold brings about great changes in the blood circulative processes. The blood circulates around the body to help feed the vital parts that it needs to function. The cold has the ability to improve the muscular walls of the cardiovascular system. Repeated exposure to the cold causes the walls to flex back and forth, very similar to someone lifting weights in a gym. When the muscular walls in the arteries get stronger, they improve the blood flow throughout the body. When blood pumps efficiently throughout the body, it helps the immune system stay alert and more able to detect and fight disease. A lot of individuals suffer from the laziness of blood circulation. By practicing cold exposures, you can learn how to breathe deeper, thus providing more oxygen to the vital parts of your body. This is a crucial understanding of the way cold exposures can help prevent us from disease. We all have the adaptive processes in our body and mind. It just takes a little push to get it going. Although it is important to remember that pushing the body too much can put you in extreme danger. So remember that extreme exposures aren't necessary. You can notice big changes in your body by simply implementing cold showers into your life. Even as you age, your body can retain the ability to pump blood efficiently. I know people as old as 80 years old who are able to take ice baths because they have performed cold showers daily. It's that easy. Wim's Method by Wim Hof. These exercises should be done with heart and conviction to reach the depth of understanding. Only then will you see the effects of the technique. I have learned to breathe differently in cold water immersions. It is a natural process simply because of the impact you must adapt. You learn to breathe more consciously, deeper, and more effectively. Exercise number one, breathing. Note, when I put easy in parentheses, I am emphasizing that I do not want you to force the explain technique. It is important to stay comfortable and not overexert yourself. Practicing will push you a little more each time. Just try to stay relaxed. Don't force it. Sit comfortably in a peaceful environment, like a bedroom, living room, backyard, in nature, whatever suits you. Now, I'll mention you also want to do this in a safe environment. Don't do this any place where you would be in danger, like in a pool or driving. Then relax consciously and begin to breathe from the abdominal region. Not too shallow, not too deep. Think of it like blowing up a balloon. Do this 30 times. Saturate the muscles and organs with extra oxygen. The goal is to let the oxygen saturate not only the lungs, but also all of the internal organs. It may feel like you're hyperventilating, but just remember that you have control. Whenever you feel saturation throughout the body, exhale completely, easy. Then inhale until you can't take in any more air. Don't force it. Then exhale completely. 
easy, and hold your breath, easy. When the feeling telling you to breathe comes, it is because of the depletion of oxygen. At this point, you can inhale fully and hold it for 10 seconds with your lungs full of air. When you complete that, you've completed your first cycle. Then, repeat. By practicing this, over time you will be able to hold each breath longer and get deeper into your system, like your immune system, nervous system, blood circulation, and heart. After each retention, which is the holding of the breath, and inhalation, close your eyes. You may be able to see electrical charges. Some categorize these lights as chakras, electric potentials, or even neurons firing. If you go deep inside yourself, you can stimulate this electricity by a pneumatic pressure that goes up the spine toward your forehead. Oxygen aids the metabolism in creating energy for the body to circulate through your system. When you empty the lungs of oxygen, hold for retention until you can't anymore. Then, inhale. Doing this will give the body new oxygen laced with boosts of energy. This provokes the electricity to go up the spine, reaching the nervous system, immune system, blood circulation, and heart. Thus, ending up in your forehead and influencing the brain effectively. Exercise 2. Meditation Yoga is the silencing of the mind. Only then can we really see the peace inside ourselves. It's no hocus pocus. The breathing exercise written above will help you get there. To reach the forehead and see the electrical charges, you must not only be patient and practice, but you must really want it. Controlling the mind is controlling your senses and emotions. When you can do that, anything is possible. By anything, I mean you will be able to still your mind and steer by the intentions to induce the lights. Once you are able to induce the lights, you will see that the technique is working. Your body will feel lighter and more powerful. This technique can calm your mind and make it pure. A pure mind can easily expand and reach its potential. That is when the light will become clear. I could talk about this forever, but what is important is that you truly want to do it. Practice it. That way, you'll come to know and understand the true nature of the spirit. Abeja Bhairaga Bhyaga, which means regular practice and perseverance. And I believe that there is Sanskrit. Exercise 3. Cold Exercises It's like I always say, the cold is a noble force. If people ask me what I mean by that, I tell them, the cold forces me to generate heat, it makes me feel alive. I see the heat as a warm friend whom I call upon to provide balance. Every yin has its yang, and the cold is about balance and moderation. Exercise 3.1, Adaptation. The first thing you should try doing is taking a cold shower after a hot one. Try to control your breaths as you face the impact of the cold on your lungs. Try to consciously control the lungs to not gasp and breathe at ease. When you're able to do this, you've taken a gigantic step in being able to consciously control the vascular system around your vital organs. Regularly practicing cold showers can lead to muscle development in your arteries. The entire vascular system altogether will be conditioned as you exercise. But let things adapt. Don't force yourself through it. Stay determined, yet patient. Once the adaptation process is complete, you can move on to the next phase, which is taking a cold shower without a warm one. You will need to be determined for this as well. Before you even begin your cold shower, you may notice a drop in your body temperature. Due to your intentions of taking the cold shower, your body will react psychosomatically. It is all part of the process. Once again, when you get in the shower, breathe controlled and let the adaptation happen naturally. You will gain the best results and best control over the body when you are completely relaxed. Eventually, you'll be able to steer the mind to consciously control the autonomic nervous system. If you try to force it, your body will fight back and try to block you from making any progress. This happens because your body isn't used to taking the impact of the cold. Once you adapt in this stage, you will feel much stronger. Some have reported an unexpected feeling of happiness, but most of all, your body's cardiovascular system will begin to run much smoother. Learn to like the cold, and you will naturally feel different and eventually have the desire to immerse yourself in a cold environment during the winter time. Exercise 3.2, Visualization. In stage 1 and 2, we learned to adapt and began controlling the body with the mind. Now, we'll learn how to control the mind and body using the power of visualization. Remember, never force anything. Let your intuition guide you. Always listen to what your body is telling you. The next time you go to perform a cold exercise, like the cold shower, I would like you to visualize heat generating within your body just before you enter. Hopefully, you will notice that it brings a sensation of warmth and control. With every breath, intensify this sensation and keep your mind focused on the heat. Don't let it stray away. We can do this with our mind by reconditioning our way of thinking. It's important to focus on the sensation and not dwell on other matters. In time, this focus will come naturally to you. Once you can feel and control the heat, go into the cold water and control your breathing. Immerse with the power of the mind over the body. 
When you first get in, you may notice a gasping response. Try to control this, and then peacefully adapt to the water. Continue to keep your mind focused on the heat sensation. Stay in the cold water for as long as it feels comfortable. As soon as you feel any sort of pain or feel uneasiness, get out. When you get out of the water, you'll probably see steam coming off of your body. This is a good thing and a nice result of your focused mind and proper visualization. Remember, never force. Let your body guide your training and only do what you're comfortable with. Exercise 3.3, sitting outside. Another cold exercise that you can do is practice sitting outside in cold temperatures. By using your newly conditioned body that you've developed during the first few stages, you should be able to now visualize a warm sensation coming from the abdominal region. Hopefully, this will allow you to comfortably sit in the snow and control your inner temperature. It is up to you to figure out how long you can sit there. It is extremely important that you do not force it. Now that you've taught yourself how to control the internal temperature of your body, you can attempt to increase your endurance and lengthen the amount of time that you can remain exposed to the cold temperatures. Exercise 3.4 barefoot snow walking or running. Another cold exercise you can try is walking or running barefoot through the snow. You will find great power when walking and running through the snow without footwear. It is a wonderful sensation. After you've completed the first few stages of the cold exercises, you will begin to understand the body at a whole new level. The heat sensation can be powerful. While you control that, you can simultaneously stimulate the autonomic nervous system. It is something that the Western society once thought was impossible. Usually, people will enter cold environments fully clothed and think that the cold has negative repercussions on the body. Without experience, it is hard for one to understand how the cold can positively affect the physiological processes of our body, including the immune system. The cold has the power to show us true human potential, if we let it. Training and natural adaptation in the cold brings about great differences in blood circulation. We have to consider this carefully because we now have a way to increase the efficiency of our body's physiological processes. Everything we consume is processed to stimulate the metabolism to give the body energy. Without an efficient system, the arteries can become clogged and the body can slowly shut down the vital organs. The cold has a positive effect on all of our bodies. It is our teacher. As you adapt, the muscles in the cardiovascular system are conditioned. The muscles contract and open, thus becoming stronger. When the muscles in the cardiovascular system get stronger, they improve the blood flow throughout the body and press it toward the finest threads of the blood circulative system. This also increases the efficiency of the heart because it doesn't need to pump as hard to force blood throughout the body. The cold feeds the immune system in the best possible way, keeping it alert and awake. With this newly utilized energy, the immune system can detect disease, specifically the inflammatory marked bodies, and immediately fix the problem. A lot of the Western society suffers from a weakened circulation system, therefore causing heart attacks, strokes, arthritis, and more. This method is a way to fix that problem and begin to improve the efficiency of the body. By practicing in the cold, you will learn to breathe deeper. Breathing is also an important factor in influencing the body in order to prevent possible diseases. It can be used to redirect blood flow and maintain warmth. It also helps focus our attention on what our body is trying to tell us. Never force your practice and listen to your intuition. It is one of the few ways to bridge the gap between our inner nature and outer nature. At times, we could be overprotective when it comes to deciding what is bad for us. Therefore, we miss out on influences like the cold that have the potential to help us grow. It is possible to be one with nature, yet maintain a normal lifestyle as you do now. With this method, I hope you can go about your daily lives while using your body's full potential. Just find the time to practice it and your body will live efficiently. We all are capable of using this ability. It is a learning process that we must ease ourselves into. Your body and mind will adapt when you're ready. I'd like to make one final note. You don't have to subject your body to extreme temperatures. You can see big changes in your system by simply implementing cold showers into your daily life. This is definitely applicable to those that are reaching old age and their cardiovascular system is suffering. These cold showers will help your body remain in great condition. This training will help keep the heart, body, and mind in shape. That is the purpose of this technique. Nothing less. Good luck. Wim Hof.